Hi, it's Tony Robbins again. Welcome to another edition of Money Masters, our meetings with the masters of marketing, the people that are really you know, shaping the forefront of innovation of how people connect with their customers, with their clients, people and individuals that are empowering people who are now in this new market economy looking around saying, how do I create a business for myself, how to create some financial freedom, and also how to take businesses that already exist and say, how do we truly innovate? How do we take things to another level? The person we're going to visit with today is part of, uh, you know, kind of this family of uh, gentlemen that uh, I've had the privilege of spending time with and become good friends with. And he's a very, very unique and special man. Uh, he's well known for what he's done in the internet marketing business on a huge scale. But I think what's uh, really unique about Edmund, most of all, is this man is really committed to growing and evolving and helping other people do the same. Um, a lot of people talk a good game, but I've gotten to see him in many different contexts and talk to so many people who have interacted with them. And, I just loved the time with him. We hung out one day in Beverly Hills at a uh, hotel. We were just supposed to eat for 30 or 45 minutes, and I think we were there for about two and a half, maybe three hours, going back and forth, back and forth. And I learned an enormous amount. I love somebody you can pitch and catch with. And Evan has got a tremendous diversity to what he can give in terms of value. And he's totally focused as a generous soul on helping people's lives be greater and better. So he's the real thing. Uh, and his background's amazing. He, in seven years, a little plus, went from starting a business literally from scratch to a business that now does over $25 million a year with 80 employees. But here's the real kicker. They're all virtual. I didn't even know that after our first meeting. I mean, these people do not work in a traditional office. And they lead, you know, he's been the leading edge in every kind of subject that he's taken on. And the one he's probably best known for initially, at least under a pseudonym, is, you know, in the dating business. So we're going to get right to it. Again, whether you own a business already, I think we're going to cover some topics here that will show you how to take that business to the next level. How do you go from whatever number you are to maybe two, four, or five fold, even this kind of economy, without hyperbole? What are the fundamentals you go after? And if you don't own a business and you're looking to create an income stream, this is a great man for you. And I think yeah, this is a great man for you to know just if you want to see how to make your life richer and more meaningful. So it's a lot of promises. Let's see if we can go deliver on them. Evan, thank you for being here with us. Great to be here, Tony. Thank you, man. I mean, everything I said about you, you're just, you're one of those unique human beings. And we've had this privilege, you got a, a kind of a family that you're a part of, of some of these top internet marketers that are truly focused on adding value. They're not the people that are out there trying to treat people as a parasite or have a parasitic relationship. They're all generous with each other. They're generous with their clients. They're focused on adding value. So maybe the thing to start with is, I always start out wanting to know the story of the person a little bit. I'd love it mm -hmm. if you'd share with us how you got into this. And then I, maybe we'll go from that into talking a little bit later here about how do you define success today? How do you define, because you know, I think people are starting to redefine what their lives look like and what is mm -hmm. meaningful for them. And I know that's a hot button for you, but would you start out and just tell us how this all started out seven years ago? What was your background? I hear looking at you today that you used to have long hair and were a rock star, so I, I want to hear the story. <laughs> Maybe not a rock star, but <laughs> well, uh, you perceived know, yourself you to be. <laughs> want to be a rock star, I was hoping, right? Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I was actually a musician, a guitar player. Were you really? And, uh, yeah, and I uh, went on tour with the band, and, you know, in my early 20s, 21, 22 years old, I realized that that might not pay the bills as well as right. I would like to have my bills paid. Right. So I went into the business world and I got myself a real estate license. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, out in the boondocks. Right. I, I didn't have any models of success. I didn't know what successful people looked like. So I, I thought, okay, people that I know of that have money or have heard of that have money, they usually either made it in real estate or they have it in real estate hmm. or there was something to do with real estate. So I just went and got a real estate license, right. jumped in. Um, had a spectacularly successful first year, um, sold one and one-third homes my whole <laughs> first year in real estate. Really inspiring, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. How did you eat? Well, how did I sell a third of a home? Is, is <laughs> yeah, well, you went to the second question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my, uh, my broker had pity on me and like let me hold some open houses and like gave me yeah, a third of the... Deal. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think I made, you know, like $2,500 my whole first year. And uh, fortunately, I had a, a kind of a part-time uh, job on the side, so I was able okay. to pay my bills. Right. And um, we, we were just talking about this earlier. Uh, I, my first place that I had that was my own place was a little 500-square-foot trailer from the 60s. Oh, you beat I, me by 100 square feet, baby. <laughs> oh, did I? Oh, you had a 400-square-foot? But, but it was, but it was okay. an apartment, so I felt like I really made it. <laughs> okay. I traded a guitar and some cash for this trailer, right? Wow. And I'll tell you what. I was more excited when I got that place than any of the great yeah. places I've lived you know, since. Anyway, so I got into real estate, and you know, I don't want to use the word failure because I don't really believe in that as a as a concept. Yeah. Failure yeah. Uh, only if you accept it. You know, if yeah. you learn from failure, if you grow from it, then yeah. all of a sudden it becomes an asset to you. Sure. But 
I was as close to a failure as I think you can become <laughs> and still not be one in real estate. And I uh, did that for a couple of years. I uh, went to work, found someone who was actually a real estate trainer who taught real estate agents and mortgage brokers how to market and sell their business. And I, I just knew that that's what I needed. So I went, studied, and then figured out that I actually liked marketing a mm. lot more than I liked real estate. Mm. So I gravitated toward marketing and sales. Um, and since then, I've realized that learning marketing and sales, learning professional marketing and sales, not manipulative marketing and sales, but right. professional, where you really find out what another person needs, find out what they're trying to accomplish, and then help them reach their goal, right. that it can be one of the most fulfilling things in life. It really helps you understand value. Right. So I, I learned about marketing and sales. Uh, actually had a little business where I did consulting for a few years, helped mm -hmm. others in the real estate and mortgage industry. Are you still that. up in Eugene, Oregon at that stage? No, uh, by then I had actually moved down to close to where we are here in San Diego. I lived in La Jolla for a few years okay. and uh, did that. And then through a strange turn of events, um, you know my one of my two best friends, Dean Jackson. Yes. He had uh, written an ebook with a marriage counselor and put it online and was selling it. And you know, he's kind of making fun of me, saying, "You know, you, you do all that real work where you you know have to roll up your sleeves, that and put like on, Dean. yeah, put on nice <laughs> clothes, and uh, you should just you know write an ebook." And you know, again, you know the way life just a lot yeah. of different things happen at once. Yeah. So uh, he talked me into it, and I had just spent the previous two or three years really trying to figure out dating. Um, when I moved here to San Diego. Uh, I, I had a great job, I had got a new car, I had a great little apartment on the beach, and but I couldn't get a date to save my life. And I was thinking, okay, now wait a minute, I've got the dream life here, and yet I, you know, I can't get a date but to save my life. Nobody to share it with. Exactly. Right. Well, you know, and I, I mean, I, was, I had anxiety, like I couldn't even, you know, I like to joke around, like if there was a woman sitting right here, waving at me and smiling, I wouldn't know how to start a conversation, wow. right? So I went to a bunch of seminars and read a bunch of books, and. Some of the stuff you know, kind of worked, some didn't, some seemed kind of manipulative. Uh, right. So then I started hanging out with guys who just understood how to relate to the opposite sex. So I kind of got that area of my life handled. Um, by this time I had a great girlfriend. You know, My life had uh, kind of taken a, a step to another level. Right. So I said, well, I learned all this stuff. It, you know, it seems like a lot of other guys would want to learn this. So I took the model that Dean Jackson showed me. I wrote an ebook. Um, an ebook just means wrote a book and then published it as a file on the internet instead right. of printing it. I wrote the book in about three weeks, just locked myself in my bedroom. Um, I didn't go for beauty or, you know, like perfect grammatical work of art or anything right. like that. I just knocked it out, got the information in there. And for the first year or two, I would get, you know, people would write into me and tell me, you know, their typos in the book and things, you know, but I was just like slamming through the business. I didn't have time to, right. you know, do that kind of stuff. Put the ebook online. Uh, taught myself, locked myself in the bedroom. You know, with, wrote the book. Uh, taught myself how to uh, do HTML and build websites and things. And I didn't know what I was doing. I went just bought a piece of software and got a book. And it took me. I think it took three weeks for my website to come online. And they were trying to figure out where the DNS was pointed and the no, numbers. No, what year would this and, be? You know, this is about 2001. Okay, right? first part of 2001. Okay. And you know, finally, my my website came online. I taught myself how to do internet marketing. And uh, the first day that the book was online, I sold a couple copies of the book. And what happened was, I mean, I was used to working in the real world. Uh, for the first seven years of my work career, up in, into and through some of the real estate years, um, I did manual labor where I worked with my hands. I worked in a copper shop with metal and, you know, I've got scars on my body from torches and like, you know, I, I did kind of, you know, uh, relatively physical work, right? Worked. Kind of picture you doing the copper stuff and, uh, oh, and yeah. the long hair and. The oh yeah, yeah. I was, I was a piece <laughs> what, of work. What the hell happened here? You, you should have seen me like when I got into real estate. I had my ponytail and I was driving around in my old Camaro and I mean it was. Now, awesome. Did you go to my seminar when it was the ponytail days? Or? No, no. I actually I've never been to one of your live oh, seminars. Oh, what did you do? I've uh, I went through your personal power program uh, and all your other stuff. And too. when did that up home studies? In the trailer. In the trailer. Uh, wow. I, uh, I found a set of your personal power. Uh, cassettes at the Goodwill Cassette. store wow. for you know like ten bucks, and I thought I had scored, right? <laughs> so I remember walking around in my trailer, pretending that I had a cape on, you know, from Personal Power, <laughs> walking around in the trailer. Thinking, this is pretty weird, but 
you know, it makes but it sense worked. to me. Change your body, change Absolutely. your Absolutely, I listened to the whole thing. Wow. Um, you know, so it was very, very influential on me. So I want to thank you, oh, just yeah. acknowledge you publicly for being, thank you. you know, and even in the industry that I'm in right now, where we sell and market information, you really paved the way for all of us in a way. So oh, a little bit of I didn't bring up that reason. I was just trying to understand what stage you were in. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so at this stage. So anyway, so, you know, fast forward a little bit, wrote the book, put it online, had the realization that I didn't have to wake up at a certain time, put on a certain type of clothing. Right. I didn't have to go do a certain type of work. I, I wasn't trading time for money. Someone was on the internet buying my product. They were downloading it to their computer and the money was being direct deposited into my bank account. Huge aha, like the yeah. big light bulb goes yeah. on on the top of my head and I say, okay, something is happening here. Yeah. And then for the first four or six months of uh, the business, I ran the whole thing myself. Right. I did the customer service. I set up the websites. If I right. needed to figure something out, I'd get a book or hire someone for 50 bucks an hour to just do a little thing for me or show me. And uh, I realized this is the first time in probably in human history that an individual person can start a business themselves. All the tools are available. They yeah. can run it themselves and they can make a good living from home. Yeah. And uh, from there, I just started building it. But how, how well did you do in those first stages with this ebook? You know, what, what happened to you economically at that stage? Well, it was interesting because I, you know, I had stopped working with my real estate clients right as I started writing this book, right? And uh, so I had a little bit of money just to live for, you know, maybe a few months, right. and you know, right. so I was kind of still living a little bit hand to mouth. Right. Um, and as the money started coming in, I just said, uh, you know, I've got to make this happen. I remember Tony, probably. I'm guessing three months into it or something, uh, I was uh, I was testing prices of my book. Okay, this is actually a very valuable business lesson because most businesses they don't test their prices. Yeah. They just say this is the price, that's what it's worth. Right. They don't ask. So uh, fortunately, I had a marketing background. And I have some friends that were saying, hey, you know, you need to test the prices. So I was doing price testing. I started by selling my ebook for twenty nine ninety five, mm -hmm. and then I said, well, why don't I try other prices? Why don't I try thirty nine ninety five? So I put the, uh, changed the price that day to thirty nine ninety five. The most books I had ever sold in a day were probably three or four or five, maybe six, something like that. Changed the price. I was living in Los Angeles. Um, my two best friends were in San Diego, where we're at now, right. visiting. I got in my car, drove down to San Diego, hung out with them for the day. We went back to their hotel, and I said to one of them, hey, can I check my stats online? Because I'm doing this price test. And I would logged in, and I couldn't believe it. I had raised the price from 29 to 39. So basically raised the price a third, 33%. Right, right. And I had sold 10 copies of my book. So I had a record day in terms of number of sales and I had raised the price. Totally counterintuitive. Wow. So my mind immediately does the math. Okay, 10 copies, 40 bucks, 400 bucks today. If I do that for 30 days, I make 12 grand. Right. I'm free. <laughs> Isn't that what the mind does? Right, that's it. <laughs> I am free. Like, I know. I'll never have to I work know. again. I know. Right? I know. Well, I've you know I've since learned that it, maybe it wasn't quite that easy. Could have right? been like we could you could have been free. Could have been, know? right? But unfortunately, the way the mind works, right? As soon as you whatever you think that number is, it always seems to expand because it isn't about the money anyway. It's about growing, right? Of course, you know? of course, exactly. Uh, but so, you were you must have been completely juiced on that moment. I was stoked. I mean, the idea that I could you know make twelve thousand dollars a month be out hanging out with my friends and people all over the world are getting value and getting served yeah, and helped yeah. and they're able to improve their lives. I mean, how could this be better? Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't satisfied and I just started building the business. I started doing live training programs, extended into uh, video and audio programs, a lot right. of things that are standard in the, you know, right. training and information marketing world. Right. And I uh, built the business. Fast forward, um, you know, the, our, our core businesses, we launch dating advice for women and we do relationship advice. Um, those core businesses now do about $20 million a year in revenue. Wow. Um, then over the last two years, I've also launched uh, trainings in the business advice space, teaching business owners who have started, founded companies, how to grow their business from startup to $10 million a year. Uh, we've also launched uh, businesses teaching how to publish information products the way we right. do, launch productivity, time management types of things. In other words, all the stuff that I couldn't figure out Right. That I was had to struggle and learn. Right. I like to go back and teach because I figure yeah. other people would want to learn it as well. And so, yeah. you know, those other businesses now do oh probably about five million dollars a year, and they're growing. And so, together, you know, we've got a twenty-five million dollars so a year business. And like I said, over or like you said, over eighty full-time employees, one hundred percent virtual. We've never had an office. 
that's spectacular. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I feel such a kinship with you because almost everything that I have that I've been able to teach in my life has come from me solving a problem that I faced. You know, yeah. and then gradually it was solving other people's problems as well. But initially it was me, and it was the same thing. Started from scratch and had my little Robbins Research International because I pictured this. <laughs> actually, started as institute. I yeah. pictured how do I get somebody when they call, and, but I didn't have the technology of you know date myself. I didn't have the internet, so I had an answer phone call. And I had a room literally in Marina Del Rey. I rented a room from a lady who had a place on the beach because I wanted to live in Marina Del Rey. And I had to decide the room was smaller than this room. And I decided, you know, gosh, I got room for a bed or a desk. <laughs> so I said, which one's going to be more important? I th thought the desk. So I created a hammock literally across there. I slept in the hammock because it was above the desk. Had my thing, Robin's Research <laughs> Institute, you know. I'm not in right now, but if you'd like to leave a message, you know. And built the whole thing. But what's different today is... The amount of leverage that you can get now from technology, I mean, like, yeah. you know, in all those days publishing a book, you got to go publish the book, you know, and so I was fortunate enough to go through the distribution channel, but let's talk about two things. What's different today? Why is this opportunity so, well, I want to cover three things. Okay. Uh, my mind's racing all the things that, that come from you. You're different than many of the other gentlemen within uh, kind of your peer group of these extraordinary internet marketers in many different ways, and I'm sure you define it in your own unique way, but one way you're clearly different is you have, even though it's virtual, you've built quite an infrastructure. Most of them have two or three people. Yeah. And, you know, and they generate, you know, anywhere from four to, you know, $10 million in business. And they have huge, you know, margins, obviously, in their business. Yeah. Um, and, but you chose a different route. So I'd like to know, why did you choose that route of building? I did the same thing, obviously, in a different way. I, I'd love to say that it was all virtual. It's not like that. Yeah. Um, you know, we had about 265 people, and they all work in buildings, right? right. Just, at, just at Robbins Research, God forbid, Twin Labs and Metabolife and all those other areas. <laughs> yeah. But I say God forbid because the world's changed, and yeah. the virtual gives you more productivity, a better risk-reward. Why did you decide to go in that direction? I'm curious. And would you still do it today? Well, I think the obvious answer why I went in that direction is because I don't like to make profit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> brother, you are a brother. You understand what I'm talking about here, right? So, yes. what we all do, I think, anyway, all of us that have tried to build a big business, yes. is we look at the small business and we go, "Wow, you know, this thing's doing a million dollars a year, and like yeah. it's throwing off all this profit." Yeah. If it was doing ten million dollars a year, I'd be making ten times as yeah, much or profit. Or million. Or if it was a hundred, I'd be making a hundred times. And we don't understand that you know expenses scale differently than profit. Yes. And uh, so, and also. I, I think of myself as a builder. As you know, I am too. It's, it's, your, it's your mission. It's more. It's different than that process. It's kind of in your nervous system. Well, that's another reason I want to interview you because yeah. I want those business builders out there to say, okay, here's another guy that's a business builder also, and but he can show me how to do it more efficiently. I'd love to learn by his experience and save myself some pain because yeah. I know you've been through those pieces. Sure. Let me, let me go back one step to okay. something I think it's of a higher, even deeper importance. Um, how do you define success today? You know, the world's changed. Mm. You've gone through different stages. How old are you now, may I ask? 38. Okay, so 38 years old, you're, you're, you're going to be in 40 at a certain stage soon, and people yep. have a funny way of looking at their life when they have a birthday with a zero on it, you know? Yeah. Um, how do you look at, how do you look at success in those early days? How do you look at it today? How do you think it defines people today? What do you think is important for people to consider before we even get into this? Because it's nice to mm. start with the end in mind. Yeah. You know, what am I really after? Because otherwise, you know, so many people I know have just gone, they've hit it, they've even succeeded, mm. and you see these people unfulfilled in the end, you know? If what you do fulfills you, then, you know, from my perspective, there's meaning to your life, it's rich. Yeah. If it's not, regardless, you're going to be really unhappy. So how do you define the success today? Has it changed? How do you think, what are the criteria people think should consider before they begin the journey? Or if they're in it, if they're going to do a restart or reset, yeah. what should they be looking at? Well, my definition of success has changed dramatically. I mean, it really I has. It. When I was younger, um, I essentially had very little. I learned now that when I refer to myself as I was very poor when I was a kid and I grew up very poor, compared to the rest of the world, I was still rich, okay, yeah. compared to most of the people. A day, you know, exactly, yeah. half the population yeah. of the world, right? Yeah. Um, so, but relatively to where I am now, I grew up very poor mm -hmm. and with a lot of scarcity mindset around me and, you know, around people who loved me very much but just didn't understand business or money or how it worked. So when I looked at how do I create success, I went and read all the books and did all the studying about how to make money. Right. I thought money would equal success. I even uh, read one great quote, which was, I've been, I've been happy and I've been sad and I've been rich and I've been poor and if you're going to be sad, it's better to be rich and sad than it is to, you know, like, it's just a lot but it's of... Not, but it's not true. Yeah, there are a lot of really interesting ideas around money and success, yeah. right? So, uh, and, I, and I've learned since then that 
what most people do is they really make money into God yeah. unconsciously You're right. because they make everything about how do I get more money and they actually equate value with money. Yeah, they'll give up their health for it and then but until they get to a stage of life where they give up all the money they had in a million years to get the health back as an example exactly. or the relationship or whatever. So for a long time I was focused on money, money, money. Mm -hmm. In fact, I just uh, did an interview with a guy named Joe Sugarman. I don't know if you yeah, know he's him. A, he's one of the first infomercial guys, the blue blockers. Exactly, right? Yeah. He sold like something like a billion dollars worth of yeah. blue blockers and he's a beautiful, beautiful guy. He's 70 years old. He can wow. do 24 pull-ups. Wow. Okay? Now, I can't, I, mean, I, I, can't do, either. I can do 10 like on a pretty good day here, <laughs> 24. Um, the guy is just, a, he's, a, he's an amazing guy. And he was talking about his philosophies of success. Yes. And he says that in his programs, he'll say, what you focus on expands. Right. If you focus on your health, your health expands. Right. If you focus on your business, your business expands. What about if you want to make money? What do you do? And most people say, well, you focus on money and it will expand. And he says, no. Why? Because money isn't the thing. Money is the symbol. That's right. So if you focus on creating value, then money expands. Right. So, so by so focusing true. on money, which so many people do, right. they miss the boat. So they're focused on the wrong thing. So I was focused on the wrong thing for a long time. Now, as simple as that may sound to somebody watching, um, I don't think there's anything that somebody could listen to here if they really were to take it in. You know, sometimes you hear something and your brain goes, yeah, that makes sense. But if you look at any human being, who has really done well in life, extremely well, and I'm talking about spiritually, physically, emotionally, and clearly financially, that is the ultimate formula. There's the only one way to become wealthy, and that is to do more for other people than anybody else is doing. So yep. you and the team of people that, uh, that I have so much respect for that become kind of let me in their family recently, yep. Uh, all universally are focused on value. That's what my entire life's been. How do you add more value? How do you make somebody a raving fan by giving them more than they could ever dream as possible? Yeah. And then their life is beyond what they could expect when they tell everybody else about it. I've been able to make unbelievable business mistakes, frankly, because I didn't know how to run a business. I was learning and I was building, but I was able to survive those because I added, my whole focus was so so on the person I love, which is my client, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the customers, the people that I felt this fiduciary responsibility, this emotional and spiritual responsibility for. So I love what he said there. So I want you to continue, but I don't want to mark it out. Anybody watching here is, I know you know it. We all know, add value, that's the way to go. But, you know, if you focus on the money, you're going to have a lot more scarcity in your life or you're going to have more money and still be miserable because the way you're going to go about getting it is not going to fulfill you long term. Yeah. So please continue. Yeah, so the transition really came as uh, as I got enough money to pay my bills, right. and I was living a nice lifestyle, and I realized that the feeling of maybe lack, a lot of it was still there. Right. Right. There was uh, still something that, like, I brought even me, after the twelve thousand dollars a month. Even after the twelve, <laughs> even after four hundred dollars a day, and I realized I had brought me with me yeah, exactly right. to success. Yeah, right? right. And you, you said it best here that I mean, it's ultimately about what you contribute to other people's yeah. lives. Yeah. And so that word contribution has come to mean a lot to me because it's not just creating value for other people. It's yeah. not just about helping them necessarily make money or whatever. Yeah. It's truly figuring out what other people want to achieve, how they want to help the world, what they want their lives to mean, and then help them accomplish that. Yeah. And you know, I think it was Zig Ziglar said, if you help another, enough other people get what they want, you can get what you want. Right. There are a lot of these types of quotes. You hear them, you read them, but I They're read true. them for you, years. You heard so much and it just, you, people get numb to it, right? Yeah, I read them for years and I thought, okay, I can say that stuff, okay, I get it. But I didn't, I didn't really get it. I didn't really understand that I have to completely take my eye off of getting. And I have to really dig into another human being and say, what are your fears? What are your frustrations? What are you trying to accomplish? What are your blocks? What can I see that you can't that I can in some way contribute to? Like, how can I help you get where you want to go? And then once that happens, that's when you realize true value. Because ultimately, I think in life, when it at the end of the day, at the end of the whole thing, at the end of you know one day or a week or a month or probably at the end of your whole life, yeah. when you really reflect back the things that bring what you might call fulfillment or you know consistent, stable, rising tide joy yeah. are the contributions to other people's lives. Yeah. And if you, if you find other people who are really trying to make a difference in the world that are at the top of business, right. philanthropy, a any different area, you know, uh, education and you really help them become successful there's plenty of opportunity there to make money to right. get some value back for yourself in that way and you can really do well by doing good right. um, but if you stay focused on how do I get money um, you know interesting thing I've noticed Tony um, you say success leaves clues all right 
I say that probably once a week, and I, uh, I uh, you know, credit you, and I, and I say, okay, that's a, that's a really interesting, you know, statement. Success leaves clues. So I should study success, see what people did to become successful, and then do some of those things, and it really works. Yeah. What I've noticed is that failure leaves clues as well. Yeah, people that does. feel like failures, and so I ask myself, what's the difference between people that feel like a success and people that feel like a failure? And I found that people that don't have a lot of abundance and success in their life have a consistent mindset. And the mindset is this. I'm going to figure out a scam or a scheme or a trick or a way to work the system. I'm going to work on it for a long period of time. Then I'm going to have the payoff day where I'm going to get lucky. Yeah. Either I'm going to win the lottery or I'm going to sue somebody or I'm going to figure out some way to you know, inherit some money. There's something. And then from that day when I get that payoff for the rest of my life, I'll never have to work again. Right. And they imagine themselves like laying on a couch or on the beach or whatever it is, and they, they, they stay focused on that. Right. And then if by some stroke of chance, as you know, if they do luck into some money, they figure out how to lose it very quickly, right? right. Most of the people that win the lottery, right. and you know, you see the person on the rocking chair, and they're like, I don't know where it all went, you know, yeah. but other people wanted it more than me, I guess. Yeah. Whereas people that are more successful, I think, in uh, in a lot of different senses, but that feel successful, they have, they don't look for a scheme or a scam. They right. don't want instant gratification, and they don't think of themselves hitting a success point and then not working ever again. They think, how do I improve myself? How do I become more valuable to myself and others? How do I add value to other people's lives? And how do I consistently pr improve over time? And how do I accrue and build right. like a tidal wave of wealth in my life? Right. And then the other counterintuitive thing that I never would have guessed would be true is that the most successful people love the work that they do. Exactly right. They love it so much that they do it all the time. When they don't have to. Well, right. And it's like they love, you know, like Donald Trump, you know, I mean, he says, I love playing the game. Right. He loves it. I yeah. mean, this is a guy that obviously could do whatever the hell he wants for the sure. rest of his life. Loves playing the game. Yeah. And that's what, when you find your niche, when you find your... Your, your passion. Your, Exactly, right? In this world, there's the little niche for you, right. for all of us, right. where we can be a part of it and we can contribute. Yeah. And uh, when you find that and you take a long-term mindset and you think, you know, I, I was talking to, you know Dan Sullivan is by yes. chance strategic coach? Yes. I got to spend some time with him recently. And he said, I want to die in the middle of my latest transformation. <laughs> That's very cool. Right? He want, he, yeah. In the middle of it. He said, yeah. he said, I want to die on stage. Yeah. That's when I want to die, is yeah. on stage. And that's, that's the mindset yeah. that the most successful people have. Yeah. That's the difference, I think. So let's talk about marketing. Great. Every business. The bottom line, you know, I, I talk about it in every one of these interviews because I want to hammer it home to everybody listens again and again and again. And you want to say, what is business? You know, you go back to Drucker, probably the greatest genius of business, one of the many ways of the last century and still true today. He yeah. said, business is marketing and innovation. That's yep. it. That's all it really is. Everything else is accounting's ancillary. You got to do it, but if you don't have you know, something that's innovative, and if you don't market it, if you don't get the hands of somebody, you don't have a business, right? Which yeah. then comes down to really knowing your customer, meeting their needs. Give me your definition of marketing today, and tell me. And you've already given a little hint to it, but tell me if you're going to describe your marketing philosophy was set your business aside and allowed you to do the things that are both successful and fulfilling. How would you define that for yourself? The way you go about it. So in business, marketing, like the big umbrella of yes. marketing, is uh, in big businesses, they consider it to be everything that you do to merchandise and sell your stuff. Everything yeah. from print advertising to your sales force to your direct mail to your branding, like it's all marketing. And the purpose really is to figure out, from my perspective, my you know version of it, is to figure out what the other person needs, really figure out what they need, and then connect, like right. fulfill that need. Uh, there's a great book, Spin Selling, by Neil yes. Rackham. Right? That book really changed my life because this guy showed up and he said, selling is not about manipulating people into buying stuff. Selling is not about trying to, you know, technique close someone. Right. Professional salespeople, based on science, studying what they do, professional salespeople dig inside the mind of the customer. They find out what the, cu the customer's real needs are, like right. really deep. And then, and only then, do they say, I have a solution that matches your need. Right. And what happens that's a beautiful thing is when the other, when the customer or the client or the prospect says, I have a need and here's what it is, and you say, I understand your need, I have something that meets that need, there's a connect. Right. They buy it. It's right. a beautiful thing. You don't have to deal with, uh, uh, 
you know, handling objections and closing people and all of that kind of stuff. Right. Now, with marketing, there are more sophisticated levels you can go to where you can accomplish this uh, through the internet, through direct mail. You can have very scalable marketing systems so that you can have your message go out to a million people and right. you know and so forth. But and the price points that are amazing today, you know, the leverage is extraordinary, like never in history. Yeah, exactly. So marketing, you know, I heard one definition of marketing years ago that marketing is fulfilling the need of the customer. Right? The best marketing is actually a fantastic product. Right. Right? If you really come down to it, a really, really amazing product does the marketing and it sells itself. And once you've got that, once you've got something that sells itself, when you put a layer of good marketing on top of it, it's unstoppable. Because that gives you scalability to some extent. Exactly. Um, when, when, when I look at the way you've gone about your marketing, though, you've used all the resources of the internet of, and all the ancillary tools that are available. I'm going to talk a little about those from a tactical level, but a strategic level. Mm -hmm. um, you've really done an un unbelievable job of becoming the expert by almost knowing more about their problem than they personally know about it within themselves. Is that a fair yeah. way of describing what I see in your strategy? So, for example, yeah. when we talked before, you're describing to me the dating side and how you could describe to that client what they were thinking, what they were feeling. You know, the typical example was you said when you were starting out your career, somebody said, well, what makes you qualified to talk about how to deal with women in this way? Would you share a little bit of your philosophy in that area? Because I think it's critical. Yeah. Because, you know, it's wonderful to say I'm going to have a product that meets the needs of the consumer, but the truth of the matter is there are a lot of industries where the products aren't that very much different, right? I mean, there are plenty where you can differentiate, but, you know, let's be honest. There are a lot of products where the branding is the only real difference between them, or yeah. significant difference. I mean, the example would be Coke and Pepsi. When Coke, when Pepsi ran those ads, you know, and, and Coke responded, you know, where, you know, what was it, two out of three people picked Pepsi back in those days. I'm yeah, old right. enough to remember those ads. Yeah, right. <laughs> and Coke responded with new Coke, right, you know? And what a disaster, one of the greatest disasters of their career for so many years, or for that company for so many years, because they didn't understand what these people wanted. It really wasn't the taste that they were buying. They were buying a brand. They were buying an identity. They were buying a feeling. It wasn't the flavor. Yeah. So, you, at least in your industry, have done an extraordinary job of finding a way to differentiate who you are, mm. you know, to your customers. Is that fair to say? Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about that, because I think it's a sure. tremendous competitive advantage that people need to avail themselves of in the marketplace that is so competitive with so many products that can be very similar. So we live in probably the most competitive business environment in history. Okay, there are more competitors that are in more niches, right. that are more savvy, that are more well financed, that are and more they're aggressive. And all worldwide now. You're competing with the whole world, exactly. not just one country, or one state, or one exactly. city. And it's just, you know, it's more than ever. But the irony is, my philosophy is, there has never been a better time or a bigger set of opportunities to completely differentiate yourself and almost eradicate the competition. Okay, give us right. the secret to that. Okay, so is that a great hook? Is he set you up right? <laughs> now, there are some ways that you can again, become more sophisticated about it. But the first thing, the first mindset that I have, and everywhere I look, every time I look, with every business person that I've ever looked with, within their business, within their, uh, their niche, whatever their, their industry is, there's always a huge opportunity to create a new category that right. they can completely own and dominate. Right. And it's by asking a simple question. What are the customers looking for right now that they can't find in the products that are already available. And the best place to get the answer to that question is those customers. Is asking the darn customers That's themselves. Right. Okay? Making it up. And most business owners don't do this simple thing. Most big companies, all the executives and all the marketing people are up in a big tall building on the 80th floor and the, the customers are you know, down on the ground floor over in a rural area. Right. And they don't go out and sit down and talk to the customers. Right. Uh, so there's a great PBS Frontline documentary called The Merchants of Cool, and it's, it's, uh, they feature MTV in this. Okay? Yes. And MTV, you know, as they say in the documentary, is the crown jewel in Viacom, a billion dollars a year in profit. Okay. Yeah. This is just a rock star of a business. And they show how MTV does it. And in one section, they show one of the executives, I really admire MTV for doing this and being so transparent, they show one of the executives going out to a house in a rural neighborhood and going into a 15-year-old kid's room and, and the kid's sitting there and you, you see the executive you know, kind of sits down on the floor and kind of diverts his eye contact and acts like a kid, like with the kid. And he's like sitting there and he's saying, so man, you know, can you show me some of your stuff? And the kid starts to be like, okay, this guy's cool. And he starts like showing him his different stuff and taking his video games down, being here, check this out. Yeah. And he's like in the world of that kid. Right. And then they make a video out of it 
and they bring it back to MTV and they show it to everyone at MTV. Right. right? And they really try to expose them to the customer. And then you see the other shot of this executive. And he's wearing his business clothes and you realize that he's actually a really savvy business guy, yeah. but he knows how to communicate. So he goes into this kid's room and he's like, oh, shucks, you know, whatever. Can you show me your stuff? Yeah. So, you know, th that's not uncommon in really successful businesses and right. businesses that really, really get it. They're inside the mind of their customer. They're right. sitting there with their customers saying, what's going on? What's happening? Right. Now, I in the past have made a lot of mistakes in this area because I've thought, you know what, those guys need to do that because they don't know marketing. Oh, right? Everyone else needs to do it because they're not really as smart as me because I read a lot of books, you know, and I'm, you know, I know what's good and I watch a lot of TV commercials. I could make a good one. I, kn I read ads and whatever. I did okay by doing that. But when I started really listening to customers and listening to the exact words that they were using, yes. to the exact phrases that they were using, that's when it all started to change. Because nobody's, nobody's doing this, okay, right. relatively. And when you sit down, let's say uh, on the internet right now, you can use various pieces of software. I can go out, I can, I can do a survey, okay? I can get on a social media website, I can go into one of the forums, I can say, you know, here's a question that I have. Um, I'm, I'm looking for people who are you know, 20 or more pounds overweight and uh, I've just got a question for y'all. And you can ask a question, and then they can send their answers to you by email. You can have them post them. I mean, you can just you can do surveys for nothing today. Right. Or if you really want to, you know, get sophisticated, you can go to Google and buy paper clicks for five or ten cents a piece. There are all kinds of ways that tomorrow I can have great answers to my questions. Right. Then I can use something like a Survey Monkey uh, or an Ask database, or I can. There's even a program online that's free called Textalizer that you can look up. And you can just dump all your text in there and press a button, and it'll show you the most common one-word, two-word, three-word, four-word phrases. And you can analyze the thoughts of thousands of people instantly with technology. Wow. And then you can take those words and say... Well, when you do that textualizer, are you taking yep. emails or communication from your customers Anything to you do want. that? Absolutely. Wow. We've done it with uh, di different things. We've taken emails that people send in. We'll have them answer surveys. And you dump it in there and press a button. Customer service, whatever. It's all it free. Wow, it's like online. Amazing. You can just use this thing. And, uh, and then I say, oh, this is what's on the minds of people. Um, I've, got a, I've got a great friend that does this uh, for basically everything that he does. Every new thing that he launches, he just does a survey, takes all the questions, and then marks it right back to the customer, and that's what they want. Wow. And by doing this, what you'll find is that within every category or every industry, there's a huge niche that's available that the customers have an unmet need, and they just can't get it satisfied. And my biggest success example is dating advice. When I started out, there were a million books on relationships and how to relate to the opposite, like, like all this stuff. And I looked at it and I said, but wait a minute, there isn't anything that's mainstream and really good on just the dating part. Right. Okay, just the dating part. Counterintuitive to narrow your focus, most people want to expand their focus. Yes. Most people that teach dating or relationships say, you know what? I'm tired of just teaching dating and relationships. I want to teach life skills. You know what I mean? Or they say, I want to teach uh, existence, you know, or something. Yeah, very few out. people are querying for existence. Well, some are. <laughs> well, right. So yeah. they think, well, if I'm teaching existence, people who want dating will come to me, of course, because that sits under. Well, actually, in marketing, it's much better to narrow your focus. Sure. A lesson I learned really from Al Reese and Jack Trout, yeah, the positioning too. guys, right? Yeah. So I narrowed my focus and I said, well, what if I cut off this end? I cut off this end, and it's just this little piece called dating advice right. from. Right before you meet, you know, the opposite sex, getting your inner game together, your confidence, right. so forth, up to the first couple of dates. That's it. That's all I'm going to cover. Right. And instead of building it as just a book or whatever, I knew about this idea of creating a niche or a category. So I built the category and I promoted the category. And as we built the business, when we would approach partners, I would say, we're the leader in the category. We created the category. And who do big companies want to work with? They want to work with number one. Right. Now, we're a bunch of ragtag people working at home at our computers, like you said. You know, Robin's internet. You know, international. Yeah. With my, I'm in my hammock right now. You know, yeah. how can I help you? In my bedroom, yeah, exactly. not outside. Yeah, right. I got to go down to my uh, office right now. So you get out of your hammock, right? I, same kind of thing. My yeah. my my uh, computer desk was up against my bed. Right. I would literally wow. like, roll into the chair yeah. and check yeah. my stats yeah. in the morning, right? Yeah. So. But when we show up, we're number one in dating advice online. And That's we great. were and we are. So we built a category. That exists in every industry. I don't care what industry it is. And I still haven't seen an exception to that rule. Oh. So there are always customers that are looking for something that they can't find right now. And uh, if you can just figure out what it is, you can help serve it. Um, uh, somebody who is just starting a business, because we've talked a lot about 
success sure. life business. I want to make sure somebody who's sitting at home who may be less sophisticated also yep. is saying, okay, this makes sense. You know, all you're really talking about is finding a need. There's plenty of needs out there and filling it. Plenty. No matter what the category is, whatever the niche may be or what the category, there's a niche there that's not found. Okay, I could create some surveys to try to find out what they're doing, but some people that might seem like uh, multiple steps, and you are a very systemic man, yeah. right, so, to be fair, which is great because that's why you show other people how to succeed. You're able to hand them a system. Sure. Right? But I, I need to figure out how to get an income so I can support my kid getting to school right now because I've lost the money I thought I was going to use. Or I need mm -hmm. to create an income stream that can really build back my critical mass, my little nest egg yeah. that I was going to retire on. or damn, I, I'm still at my job, it ain't looking good, not for me, it ain't looking good for my industry or for this company. Mm -hmm. You know, I need a backup plan right now, yeah. and, and I gotta do this part time. Sure, um, I'm gonna give you an inner game step, and then I'm gonna give you an outer game oh, step. That, that, that sounds like you have, and that's perfect, because <laughs> that's the truth. If you don't make the change in the inner side, that's my biggest complaint about yeah. most people that teach in this industry. People go get this information, but they haven't changed what's going on in the inside game, and so they don't follow through. So thank Absolutely. you for that. So let's start with what's real, the, the inner game. So here's the, here, here's the so key inner game thing, up. right? This is the thing that acts as the glass ceiling that really holds people back. I think it creates failure for most people that try to start businesses. When you go from working in a job to having your own business, you actually have to retool your psychology. Yeah. You have to completely change the way that you look at the world, yeah. okay? Dan Sullivan, who we mentioned before, he's got a great way of uh, framing this. You have to move from a value extraction paradigm to a value creation oh, paradigm. Oh, I've never heard that. That is so perfect. That is okay. so perfect. Most people try to extract value from the world. Or from their employer. Or from their employer. And that's where we're getting into rampant consumerism and screwing up the planet. They're trying to extract. And they just, no one ever taught them. You could create value from yeah. nothing. You yes. can literally put things together and innovate, and it feels so much better, and it's better for everyone. So you have to do that. But to get to that point, what you have to do is you have to overcome a tricky little self-serving mechanism that we all have. All right. So you know whether you buy into evolution or not, most people would agree that there has been some level of evolution in humans. Okay, whether including you, their psychology. Yeah, exactly. And I'm talking mostly in their psychology yep. right now. Okay, so a few thousand years ago. It was all fight or flight all the time. I mean, right. we're talking saber-toothed tigers around, and most people don't live past 15 years of age and all that kind of thing. Pure survival. Pure survival, right? Well, now it's a different universe, okay? W most of our basic needs are met. We've got roofs over our heads. We've got food and so forth. But we still have those mechanisms that are inside of us. Okay. And they have a good intention. They're trying to save us, but they can really, really screw us up. So what I've found is that most people who come from this scarcity mentality where they feel entitled and they, they have their job and they don't want to lose their job and they play all these games to kind of keep their job. And, and they, they also value it constantly how much I'm giving versus what I'm getting. Exactly. They're playing this transaction game right. and they're always trying to get the better end of the deal. Yep. Always. Right. Okay. So to the average human, fairness means it was equal or I got the better end of the deal. Okay, so I can rationalize that it was fair to you if I got the better end of the deal, but I can't if it was the other way around. So I call this the justice mechanism. Or and the selfish gene. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> it's a selfish gene like brain, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly right. So to me, the justice mechanism is that mechanism that says, as long as I get, as long as it's equal or I get better, then it's okay, right? right? But I can't stand to see the other guy get the better, better end of the stick, like the better, or I can't stand to see the other guy get the better end of the bar. There have been a psychological tests where they, they'll they see, on like on a betting element, how far somebody will go, where people people decide how far somebody's going to go, exactly. where one person gets to name the amount of money, and the other person's got to settle for it, right? right. There have been multiple studies like that, so I, I think... Um, so I'm actually going to use that example. Oh, okay. okay I was just about to go okay, there. Okay. okay so there's a there's a psychological uh, experiment that like they do. Like a tipping point. So what they do is they sit two people down and they say, "Okay, you're A and I'm B," and then they put a hundred dollars in cash in front of A and they say to A, "You can divide the mo money up between the two of you right. any way you want." But what, here's the trick: B gets to decide whether or not you both get the money or you both don't get any money. Right. So what A usually does in most cases, by the way is says, okay, B, you get 50, and I get 50. Right. And then B, I would say, okay, we both get the money. But in some cases, A will say, oh, you know what, B, you're going to get free money anyway, so I'm going to keep more for myself. And the tipping point you're talking about is right around the 70-30 point. Where it is, 70, 30. So where A says, I get 70 and you get 30, and that's where B says, even though I don't know you, 
even though I've never met you, and even though this is thirty free dollars, I can't stand to see that son of a bitch right. get a better deal than me. And right. B says neither of us get any money, and both of them get nothing. Yeah. So then they said, well, maybe this is you know because we're doing this in America, and seventy or thirty bucks isn't that big a deal. So then they went over to third world countries right. where a hundred dollars is a few months' income. Right. Guess what? exact same thing. Same ratio. Wow. Someone will walk away from a month or two months of income because they can't stand to see that other guy get the better end of the deal, wow. even though they don't know them. Wow. Uh, another example of this that I like to use that's a great analogy is uh, the monkey trap that they use in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. where they hollow out a tree and they cut a little hole and they put a nut in there right. and the monkey puts his fist. He won't let go and the hunter can just walk up and kill him and throw him over his shoulder yeah. because you know whatever you want to call it, the ego or the selfishness, the monkey just can't stand the greed to let go of that thing. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite examples of the right way to do this is there was a restaurant in San Francisco, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, the guy who ran the restaurant, restaurant decided, here's what I'm gonna do. When you sit down at my restaurant, I'm gonna put down two glasses and I'm gonna put down a big jug of wine and I'm gonna say to you, drink as much wine as you want and tell me at the end how many you drank. Right. I'm gonna trust you. So the press came, showed up, said, you're giving away this wine, don't you know people are ripping you off left and right? And he said, yes, but look outside, there's a line around the block of people <laughs> waiting to get in. So one way, one way is to be upset by the selfish gene, or the other way is to figure out how to utilize it in exactly. a way that's you know, intelligent. So, so the justice mechanism, here's what I like to say, learn to love getting the short end of the stick. Oh, wow, that's brilliant. Learn to love it. As long as you're structured effectively. Well, you, you know. <laughs> you got to be careful. Because in business, exactly. you can be the person. I've been the person who's like giving and giving and giving and giving. And in the end, there's no business left in that piece, too. So exactly. There's this is an inner game thing. Yeah, I okay, okay, we'll, we'll get okay. to the outer game you gotta thing. you got to balance it with the outer game exactly, thing. Exactly, okay, right? Okay, got it. Uh, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, Chuck, the Wine Library TV guy. Yes, oh, right? yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, he's fun, right? Guy. So I interviewed him recently, and he said, I call it the 80 20 rule. Yeah. You get 80, I get 20. Right. That's the way I like to do business. Now, here's where it gets really fun. Once you get over it in the inner game and you love to see another person getting the better end of the deal, you right. just love it. Like They get to feel like they won, yeah. and you get to feel like you contributed to their life. You, you don't worry too much about yeah. what you got. Then you can kind of take a deep breath, and then you can go into business with this. Got okay? It. Because what, like, let's say the internet allows you to do it. Yeah. In the past, if I wanted to, 20 years ago, okay, when you were doing this, if you wanted to give a one hour video to someone, you had to produce the video and get a studio, and then you had to go to you know an avid editing machine, right. and you had to do all this stuff, and you had to have the thing reproduced and have a master made. To make a thousand copies of a video, you would be lucky if you got off at being able to hand them to people for 20 or 30 bucks a piece out the door. Well, lucky, well, right? Well, well, now we're on the internet. We're sitting here with cameras, yeah. right? This stuff's gonna be dropped into a Mac. If we wanted, if someone put a gun to the team's head right here that's right. around us right now. It could be out tonight, distributed. This thing could be online being sold in two or three hours. Totally true. Okay, and it could be distributed for pennies. Yeah. So the dynamics, the internet has changed the whole dynamic yeah. of, of, of the, um, the economics of the, right. of the situation. So what I can do now is I can take this video that might be worth 50 or $100 kind of right. list price, and I can sell it for $5. Right. And I can have a million people come and give me five dollars for it. It's the music business. The music business was the first one to really take advantage of this at the highest level. Maybe outside porn. <laughs> Maybe porn was the first thing they they made the business go. Right. They brought. They drove the technology. Yeah. You know, I was reading some figures of percentage of people that did searches in the beginning and what generated revenue on the web, and it was porn was the biggest piece. Yep. But but the music business is the same model you're talking about. Exactly. And they're still reeling from it though to figure out because they had an old business model that's been disrupted so massively. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Yep. I mean, interrupt. But it's so part of marketing is getting the customer to see how they're getting a bargain. Getting them to see how, when they're taking out their $100 to buy something from you, that they're thinking, this guy is, I like him, but he's not that smart because he's given me $1,000 worth of stuff for my 100 bucks. Right. So they feel like they're getting the better end of the deal and then replicate that a million times. Got it. Okay? So in the past, the, the, what poor people do, Tony, is they ask the question, how could I get a million people to each give me a dollar? Right. Did you ever think about that when you were younger? I used to think no, about those kind of things, like, if I could come up with a way 
to get a million people to give me a dollar, I would be a millionaire, and it wouldn't. They wouldn't be out that much money. It's only a buck. Mm-hmm. You remember those Ponzi schemes? Like it says in. You the, sound like you were being ready for politics at that stage. <laughs> well, yeah, I was thinking about. It. I didn't know so, but I was thinking. You didn't know it. that what you really thinking is preparing right. yourself to be a politician. You see the classified ads that say. <laughs> How to have two thousand to five thousand dollars a week show up in your mailbox? Yeah. Send five dollars in a self-addressed stamped envelope to All this right. address. And yeah. what comes? I never did this, but I heard what comes back is a little piece of paper that says, "Run an ad that says how to have two thousand <laughs> to five thousand dollars a week show up in your mailbox." And I was like, "That's my kind of thinking, right?" But that's how but poor it's not sustainable people think. because you you know there's nothing you haven't really added the value. Right. right. But that that's the mindset. That yeah, is how I poor get, people think. I agree. How successful people think is. How can I get? How can I give a hundred dollars worth of value to a million people, and then say, if you got some value out of that, would you give me ten dollars in return? Right. That's what. It's Wikipedia. Exact. That's what rich people think. Yeah, I because got it. I'd rather have ten million dollars yeah. and gotten screwed yeah. on the other ninety yeah. than I would, you know, have all of. A hundred dollars, and right. you know, it's like I get to cramp it right here. So, right. one of the uh, examples of this is uh, I, I've kind of come up with this little. I mean, it was just a little catchphrase that I started talking about, and it really caught on, called "Move the Free Line." Yes, you've probably heard this phrase. Yes, and the philosophy is simple. It's that in the past, um, things used to cost a lot more money to make, to sure. distribute, to and a huge amount of risk to, to even try it. Exactly. I was just talking to a group of guys a couple of nights ago. I was in. Uh, I had a networking meeting, and I had some of the founders of some of the top kind of social media companies and kind of new media and just really interesting people at this meeting. And one of them said, "Look, ten, twenty years ago." If you wanted to build a piece of software, you needed a million dollars just yep. to write the first line of code. Right. Literally. Yep. Just to get all the stuff together to write the first line yep. of code. Yep. Today, and this is now, I mean this is just, you know, it's changing and going down exponentially. Now, for $10,000, okay, 1%, you can hire a team of developers that can build a piece of software, get it up and running on a virtual server and have a prototype that's running for 10 grand. Okay. It's not the same then as it was. the cloud so you can have scalability at whatever level you want. Yeah, Amazon.com right. is allowing you to scale up using their servers at a yep. fraction of the price, right? So it's just not the way that it was anymore, right? Yeah. Everything's kind of new here. So um, the way we've done this, I'll just give you an example. Last year, we launched a program called the Guru Mastermind, where we taught authors, speakers, coaches, entrepreneurs who wanted to learn what we do to right. create, publish, market, sell information products online, how right. to do it. Because right. um, I like to teach whatever we sure. learn. So uh, when I launched it, I said, okay, so I'm the guy that says move the free line. I got to do it bigger and better than I've ever done it before. Right. What would just be the ultimate free line moving thing? So we created a one-year program that's monthly that you go through for a year, which has live trainings and you know, all kinds of different training, teleclasses and webinars and guests and right. I just tried to create the best program possible. And then I said, what would be what would be the ultimate way to get people in the door? So I said, why don't I essentially give away a month of it to everyone? That's great. Why don't I create and my goal was to give away a thousand dollars worth of value to anyone who wanted it. Wow. And we started doing webinars and we had teleclasses and I gave we built custom software that we gave away to people and we wow. did all kinds of training and uh when I counted I can't remember the exact numbers but something like 20,000 people or something went through this whole process. Did we create and give away 20 million dollars worth of value for free for nothing with zero expectation? I don't know. I mean, you'd have to be the judge if you went through the training, but it felt pretty good to do that, right. and then at the end when we launched the business, we launched a multi-million dollar product launch of a brand new business that was totally untested in a new market with new customers. And but you also had an instant brand. You created a brand in a month. Exactly. Right because, from nothing. Because all these people had to become raving, assuming they enjoyed the experience, which I heard everybody did. Yeah. They're raving fan customers already, and you didn't have any barrier for them to have a taste of your experience. I and mean, Most of the time you're spending all this money so that someone hopefully will get a taste of what you do, enough of a taste that they'll want to do business this with you you're just completely reversing it the move of the free line I, yeah. I was actually I was wondering who I've heard that phrase several times I didn't realize when they created it. I was actually corrected recently by Frank Kern he said no no no, I didn't create that he said Evan did so he gave me full credit <laughs> oh, that's um, good. let's go to the second piece let's go to the external world what mm-hmm. do they got to do now they're brand new trying to find a way to generate an income stream trying to create value in some way but not quite sure what the first steps are give me the steps okay so I'll give you two paths, but they're both the same thing, Perfect. basically. One would be an online strategy, because I'm a real believer in the internet and yep. what it's allowing us to do, and I'll tell you about that in a sec. And another one would be an offline strategy. Perfect. Okay. Uh, 
the, the, the common denominator here is you got to go figure out in an experiential way. You have to get experience and understanding of how to create value for, for others mm -hmm. and then how to get value back in the form of money. Right. This is a skill that you have to learn. You actually have to practice it. And once you get good at it, then you get it. Then you can start scaling it up in terms of a business. But right. I think you've got to learn how to do it essentially one-on-one -on -one to start with. Uh, if you're going to do it offline, let's start offline. I recommend that you go into one of the sales and marketing type industries and spend a couple of years working there. Mm -hmm. Network marketing is a great place to start. has a weird reputation, but you will learn so much if you will stick with it for a few years. Real estate and mortgage, another great industry. As we're doing this right here, it's a, it's a rough place to go, right. but I'll tell you what, you would not get a better education if you went in right now and had to fight for your life in that industry. I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I wouldn't argue with you on that at all, because I, I have my original training with like door to door, selling a product that I was passionate about, it was music. Tony, when I was first in real estate, um, you know, door knocking, right? Yeah. Door, co you know, yeah. cold Working calling, your farm. picking the phone up, exactly, doing the farming, whatever. Uh, so one day I was going to do some calling, and it's kind of fuzzy. I think I was going to call for sale by owners and try and talk them into listing with me or right. whatever. So I was looking at the phone, looking at the phone, thinking, okay, I'm going to call. I'm going to, I just looked at it and I got all worked up and I got nervous and I can't do this. And I finally just went home and went to bed because <laughs> I was so distraught by the whole thing, right? I was so distraught. Yeah. I went out to go door knocking one time and I looked, looked at the doors and I couldn't do it. I went down to the restaurant and got a piece of cake and like, <laughs> I just had to like get some sugar to like, I, I had to get someone in my office, and she and I went out together yes. to, to knock on doors. And it was like, and when the door would open, I'd be like, "Here, run!" You know, like <laughs> right. I, you know, I remember one time I, <laughs> I mean, you know, a real estate agent's worst nightmare. I was out trying to get for sale by owners. And I had my girlfriend driving me around for moral support. Oh my gosh! And I got out of the car at the sidewalk, and the you know the house was set back like probably a hundred feet from the street. And as I got out, it's like it was almost like there was a switch on the sidewalk. I get out, and the guy comes out the door and he goes, "You a realtor?" And I said, yeah. And he's like, get out of here. We don't want, you know, and I would jump back in the car and so forth. So Build it was, a lot of respect with your girlfriend, too. It was so traumatizing, <laughs> right, those experiences. But when I look back at them now, I realize to overcome that stuff, what yeah. I had to do in here, it made all the difference in the world. Yeah. It really did. So I recommend offline, and I recommend everybody do this anyway. Get into an industry where you have to work with people one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, and you have to help them get results that they want, work for a reputable yeah. company. Real estate, mortgage, insurance, multi-level marketing, they're all great options, right? right? right. You have to become something that you're not. Right. Now, the internet is the fast track for this, right. okay? If you, wanna, if you want a fast track and you wanna be able to make money literally tomorrow, okay? Some people that I know have gotten online and have been making money in days. Right. You miss, I want to you know, caveat, you miss some of the great experience of interacting with people live, right. but you can do the fast track version by getting online and doing what's called affiliate marketing. Right. Are you familiar with affiliate marketing? Yes, okay, so affiliate marketing is basically where you get online and you go to a company who sells a product and they say, you can sell our product. And there right. are thousands of companies and there are thousands of products. Big giant companies like Amazon.com as an example. You can go sign up for their, what they call their associate program, which is an affiliate program, and you can sell anything on their website and you can make some of the money. Right. I just started uh, a blog about, oh, eight weeks ago, Tony. I haven't blogged consistently in my life. So I started a blog right. and I said, since I'm gonna be blogging, I'm going to link to anything that I mention because right. I want to just track and I want the experience of what it's like to kind of start over. Right. So I mentioned a book and I put a link and I signed up for the Amazon Associate Program and people right. went and bought it and now I've been watching it and I've made like a hundred bucks in <laughs> affiliate commissions over the last like two months doing it. But you know what? I got a little rush because <laughs> it's cool. You know, writing about something that but I'm passionate, passionate about, about. Yeah. and then people look at it, and then they go buy the product or the book or the, the CD or whatever it is, and they go, that's so awesome that Amazon is rewarding me for sending them customers. Right. It's super cool. So you can be a partner with Amazon.com. You can sell anything on their website. Right. Um, if you want to sell information products, ClickBank is a great place. You can go to their marketplace. You can click on it on their website without even signing in. You can pull down. You can look at all the different categories. You can see a list in order of all the different things that are selling on their website, which is selling best, which is selling worse, how they're working. And then you can click on the links and go look at the websites. I mean, you can emulate stuff on there yourself if you, if you want to just start your own business. Yeah. But it's better to start a ClickBank account or go to Amazon.com or go to Commission Junction, which, which is another huge website with thousands of affiliate programs. You can sign up for eBay's affiliate program. You can become a partner 
with any of these huge online businesses. It's another thing that the internet allows you to do you couldn't do before. And instantly. You send a customer to them, the technology tracks it all behind the scenes, the person buys something and they send you a commission. Yeah. And the tracking is pretty good. Yeah. It was scary when I first got started, but right. now it's pretty solid. Right. And then you can go and you can do something like, you can start a blog. I recommend that everybody start a blog. Start one today. Go to WordPress or Blogger, wordpress.com, blogger.com, start your own blog, and every day sit down and write something. And I don't care what it is, write something that offers value to other people, because it sharpens up your communication. Right. You start learning these skills. Right. You listen to this interview and you go, maybe I need to put a hook at the beginning. And instead of just writing about a book. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> instead of just putting a book about fitness that I read and saying, here's a good book about fitness and here's what I learned, you know, you go, oh, you know what? I'm going to write a headline called how I lost 13 pounds in 30 days. And now it's super engaging and you see people really get into it and they're fascinated with it rather than just my weight loss adventure or right. something that's not compelling right. and then you right. see the connection. Right. Um, another miracle of modern day marketing is the search engine. Right. And in marketing, getting started, the pay-per-click search engine. Most people still don't know what this is, but you can go to Google or MSN or Yahoo and you can set up an account and you can start buying clicks. So you can run little ads. You notice on Google when you do a search, all of the natural search results show up on the left. Well, on the right hand side, those are paid results. Right. And those people are paying by the click. So right. if you click on one of their ads, they're going to pay Google 50 cents or 5 cents or 3 bucks or some of them are 50 or 100 dollars a click, which is really scary. You got to be careful with you your marketing. You better have a great product. Yeah, exactly. And you better know your numbers, yeah. right? But you can start buying traffic tomorrow for five cents a click. Some of them you can even buy it for one cent a click. So you can start getting traffic. So you can play matchmaker. And I know people, I know one kid, I mean, this is an extreme example and I call him kid, but he's 25 years old and this guy makes millions and millions and millions of dollars and doesn't sell any of his own products. He's just right. a matchmaker. He just gets leads from search engines and other sources and sends them to companies who want the leads. Right. And he's and right there. good at converting. Exactly. Right. And what's great about pay-per-click search engines, I'm a direct response marketer, okay? I'm, I, I use a lot of different philosophies of marketing and branding, but direct response is how I got started. And in direct response marketing, what we're always looking for is to get the customer to do something, to take right. some action. Right. We don't want to just put our name out there, we want to get them to take some action. Right. Well, what's great about pay-per-click advertising and marketing is already taking yeah, by definition they're taking action right. so I actually have a whole philosophy around choosing a niche in starting a business or launching a product we, if you want we can talk about that in a moment I, I want to make sure we go back to that because we talked about that off camera earlier I think that's very important okay so that, that's a key piece well one of the great things is if you're testing a new niche you want to find customers who are looking for the product mm -hmm. and you don't want to try to talk people into wanting your product right. that's a hard game you want right. to find people who are already looking you can test it on a search engine and right. by definition they're looking. So if right. it doesn't work on a search engine, you're probably going to have a hard time making it work anywhere else. Right. So you can get on there. It's also a great direct response marketing training. It's like training wheels or a simulator for direct response marketing because you have to write a 25 word headline and then two lines of 35 words in your copy and you can see and you can change the headline and by changing the headline you get double the level of click throughs and the whole thing's tracked for free inside of Google. I mean, you're buying the clicks from them, but they're giving you a billion dollars worth of tracking and stuff that you can watch and look at all these dashboards, stuff that just 10 years ago when I was doing offline marketing, Never what years. we had to do to get that kind of stuff, I mean, you would have had to have a team of like 50 people all with, you know, math and PhDs, you still got it. and you wouldn't even be close. No. You're using Google's system to, you know, train yourself to do marketing. So affiliate marketing online, I would say, is the best way. I actually think it's the best way to get started in business right now because awesome. of what you have to learn. You don't need a website. You don't. You literally don't need anything. You can wow. start with no money from scratch. I mean, you need a little bit of money to buy some clicks, but you can actually do it with no money. Social media. You can get on Twitter and just start twittering. You can get on a blog and start blogging. You can get on Dig and Facebook, and you can start. You can just start creating content and ideas. And I mean, I know people that, you know, they say, okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going to start selling um, electronics. You know, I love these things. Uh, you know, digital cameras. So, you know, one guy I know, he got on, made a little video about a digital camera, and he got on there. Got you know his little webcam. Said, "Here's the digital camera. Here's what all the features are." Went online, put it on YouTube, put it in a couple of other places, put a link to Amazon.com, and immediately started making money because people watch his little review and they say, oh, "That sounds great. I want to buy it." And then there's the link. 
Right. And then they go to Amazon, and Amazon sends them a check for 10 or 20 bucks or whatever every time, every time they buy them. So you can do this, and there are literally there are millions of people now making money oh, this way. There are amazing. millions of people that have started their own businesses. They're achieving financial freedom. They're helping people, real customers, buy high-quality products. You can be a partner with any company that you've ever wanted to in the world. In the past, if you wanted to sell you know, JVC camcorders, or you wanted to sell Canon cameras, to figure that out, you got to get a business license, and, and then you know, well, Canon. No matter the risk you're going to take, you got to convince Canon. You got to have the physical space. You got to advertise. And, yeah, oh my it God. never happened. Well, now I can go on Amazon and just get a link to the Canon camera, and then write a review of it. And now I'm selling Canon stuff, and I don't have to warehouse it. They just send me a check, right? So, so tell me this. You're, you're, I love the quality of your thinking, this, how systemic you are. I love how you start back here at the very beginning and go, what's the internal change that's got to happen? And then yep. you're stepping in and saying, what's the muscle and psychology and reference base? And then yep. what's the easiest way to get going? So the next obvious question is, tell me about the two pieces that are the basis of these businesses. So much I could do. If I'm going to narrow my focus, if I'm going to get a niche, how do I select the best niche for me, and how do I, you know, be more certain that that niche is going to be successful? That's one. Great. And then two, how do I start to build a list of people that's significant enough that the income is not just ten or twelve dollars, but I really end up having a business? Yeah, right. Okay, so th these two concepts of niche and list are are very modern. Um, everyone's wondering these questions because when you get online, you got to know what niche to go into, and if you don't have a list, then you're wasting most of your money because right. you're not building a relationship with people, right? So uh, the way I like to say it, Tony, is that your market and your marketing are two different things mm -hmm. and your market actually drives your marketing most people jump right into how do I sell it what's my headline gotta be how do I brand it what do I call it and I say wait let's step back a step and ask what is the product or service that you're going to sell and who's going to buy it because that's what makes up the market and if you get the product to customer match if you get the market right, right. then the marketing kind of takes care of itself right. so the big question in the market is what is the niche what niche do I go into and I think of the business niche and I actually think of each product as its own niche hmm, interesting. now most products fail in the market something like I've read estimates 80 to 90 percent of all new product launches fail right. Over 95% of all businesses fail in five right. or in, within 10 years. Right. You know some of the numbers that I've heard. Last yeah. number they said, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So these are you know these are huge things to get your head around, and you got to realize that there's a lot of professionals out there too doing this. That's right. Right. So you know for the average person, those numbers might even be a little bit higher. So I said, okay, what causes this failure? Why do products fail? Why do they succeed? So I put together a little three-question test, simple test that you can ask yourself that you can run any business or product or niche idea through. Now, by the way, just for people watching, if you don't have a business, this is obvious, but if you do have a business, sometimes it's good to think about if I'm developing a new product or a new service, or if I'm looking a way to uh, generate a brand new experience within my business, rejuvenate my business, then maybe time to look at a new niche as a product or as a service or as a whole. So yep. I just want to mark out, because we've got two types of people that are watching here, and they both, I think this is, this is core information for both of them. So go ahead, your three okay, questions. Okay, so I actually teach this system to typically to business owners. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I actually teach this to people who already have a business right. about how to narrow their niche and so forth. Right. So this is very, very relevant to, to even very successful business owners. I think so too. So the first question is, is my prospect experiencing pain and urgency or what uh, I think as Jeff Paul calls irrational passion? Right. In other words, is there a heightened emotional state? Right. Okay. If there's no heightened emotional state, then the prospect isn't motivated, then you've got to talk them into buying your stuff. And this is typical. I, I, the other day, Mike uh, K was mm -hmm. giving me some of the questions that he was getting from people. And one of the questions they were saying is, the man was saying, I'm selling my art, and I'm doing everything everybody's teaching me, but it's not really working very well. And exactly. I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, if you're selling you know, you know, your art, A, does that product really appeal, and B, you know, is art at this stage a passionate, you know, endeavor for people in terms of their investment of their money? Right. The answer is no. So, uh, you know, they might be doing. It depends on which niche, right? Obviously, right, of which specific niche. But I'm talking about somebody who doesn't have a name doing their art. There's a hell of a lot of that art I can get for free right now. You know. So, exactly. But anyway, um, so is it a passion niche? An example of a passion niche versus a dispassionate niche, and how you see the difference is what? Well, let me start with. Um, most people don't want to hear this. But pain and urgency, that inter intersection where someone's experiencing internal or external pain, and there's an urgency to solve it, that's where the biggest opportunities that are. That makes sense. So they both meet. Most humans are far more motivated by moving away from pain right. than they are by moving toward pleasure. You yes. know this stuff. Okay. Most people that launch businesses want to create something that's all happy and joy and art and their self-expression and right. so forth. And 
most people aren't looking for that. Okay, that's it's it's harder to do that. So I actually say I actually teach connect on pain if you can do that because you can really help people. Uh, but also pain that they got to solve now. Some exactly. people will live with a pain for years and years and years, and even though it's there, they've kind of gotten used to it. So that's why you need both of them there. That makes total sense. So accountants, okay, there are a lot more accountants than there are tax strategists. Why? Because everyone gets to April 14th and says, oh, damn it, I didn't. So they run down to H&R Block with their box of papers and they, you know, whatever, because yeah. there's pain and urgency. They know right. they got to get it done or, right. you know, they imagine jail or something. Right. Whereas tax strategists, right, who calls up the tax strategist, you know, the previous year before they even go in and says, you know, I realized last year that I was running down to the accountant at the last minute and I probably wasted thousands of dollars why don't I talk to you for an hour for three hundred dollars, and I'll save you know who yeah. knows maybe thirty thousand. That doesn't happen. Tax yeah. strategists, uh, you know, yeah. they have to work hard to get their business. That's right? true. So there's you know there's just one example. Perfect. Um, in you know in my my reality, dating advice. Right. There's a lot of pain and urgency around dating, yes. right? I mean, it's the most primal thing that there is, right? And so, that urgency can build at certain stages of life. Yes, it, <laughs> yes, it certainly can, right? I'm starting. I, maybe I should uh, read some of my own products right now myself. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, um, so, so pain and urgency or irrational got it. passion. Got it. Okay. So there's got to be massive emotion. Yeah. Number one. Number two, is my prospect proactively looking for solutions? Mm. So have they gotten to the point where they've gotten off their lazy ass yeah. and they're actually out looking? Because okay? some people will live with the pain and the urgency and still not act. Exactly. So I'm, look, I'm looking for the person raising their hand saying, okay, I'm really going to do something about it at this stage. I'm at least looking for something to do about it. Exactly. We Got go it. through a predictable pattern sure. when we run into a problem. We realize we have a problem, then we go, uh-oh, maybe I better go start looking at options. Then we go out and we look at options, and we narrow them, we choose, we take action, then we run into other problems, and right. it welcome to life, life right? exactly the right. hamster wheel that most people are on. So if you catch someone before they've started proactively looking for solutions, then you have to play the game of talking them into wanting your product. And that is a very tough game. That's talking right. people into wanting what you're selling is, it's hard work. I mean, it's right. really hard work and right. it's not very rewarding work financially. Right. So find people that are proactively looking for solutions. It's one of the reasons why I love search engine marketing so much because by definition, they're looking. Right. So if you go advertise on the search engine and it works, then you know that you've got something. If you advertise on the search engine and it doesn't work, that can be one indicator that maybe people aren't looking for what it is you're selling. Right. Right. And question number three is, does your prospect have few or ideally zero perceived options? Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, because if a human has lots of options, and this actually goes all the way back to, you know, back up to like NLP, right? right? right. And impoverished models and so right. forth. If a person has few or no perceived options and a huge problem and they're looking for solutions, when they find you, they're a buyer. Well, if there's a wall here and a wall here and a wall here, it's amazing how you move in this direction, right? Exactly. Yeah, I get it. And I so what it. a lot of people do is they go into business and they say, well, I'm going to go into this juicy niche where there are a million competitors. Right. And then I'm just going to be another one of them rather than saying, no, wait a minute, within this niche, where is there a need that's not fulfilled, right. where I can be the only perceived option? Dating advice is a great example, where I looked at it all and I said, well, there are a million people teaching relationship advice, but there aren't any, there's no one teaching how to get into it in the first place, so if I carve that niche off and I right. say, that's dating, that's all we do, um, there are a million people looking for that. Million, there are a billion people looking for. I want the dating advice, right. and when they pick up the relationship book, you know, the relationship advice book says, "Give your partner compliments. You know, <laughs> be thoughtful. <laughs> Listen to them. Don't get angry. You know, like, and you know, the average guy is like, well, okay, you know, what? How is this helping me? Yeah, you know, yeah. it's the you know the opposite of what I need yeah, to do. Right. So, you know, fewer no perceived options. So, right. is the prospect experiencing pain and urgency, you know, or irrational passion, elevated emotion, elevated emotional state? Irrational passion too would be a golfer versus you know you, every golfer is trying to take off whatever number of strokes off his golf game exactly. versus somebody who uh, it plays a sport but the, there isn't the same level of time, energy, or investment. You know, they also don't have the same frustration that golfers very often have. So sure, exactly. Okay. Okay, Proactively ahead. looking for solutions, fewer no perceived options. Got if it. you can get three yeses, my experience is you owe it to yourself. You owe it to the world to get out there and test that product. Right. You've got to get it out to the world because it's probably a huge opportunity. Yeah. If you don't get three yeses, you probably should figure out how to retool your niche or your market or your product until yeah. you do get three yes's to dramatically increase your probability. Yeah, your probability is successful. That's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Yeah.
Let's talk about lists, because the lifeblood of an online business, not the only one, obviously you said affiliates sure. and so forth, but it's customers, it's clients. And the hardest thing normally is to get those customers or clients, to keep those customers and clients, make sure they're not clicking out or hanging up in the world we're in right now where it's easy to drop out. Yep. Tell us how do people who are just starting, how do they go start to build that list? They're brand new, they don't know anything about building a list, and if you can give me a parallel track or you know, the opposite uh, decision-making uh, Y or V, if they have a business, how do they activate that list or expand that list geometrically? Can we hit on those two? Absolutely. Great. So just to tell you, um, I've done the math in my mind, kind of done some rough calculations. Uh, if we didn't have a list, if we didn't switch from just selling products to the mindset of build a list and add value to them, our business would probably be one-tenth the size that it wow. is right now. Wow. might even be one-twentieth. might be 5% the size. Tell me why. Because... Uh, in the past when we started, it was a one-shot sale. You come to our website, if you don't buy a product, you're gone and I never see you again. Right. When we switch to, you come to our website, we ask for your name and email address, we want to follow up with you, we want to build a relationship, then after you buy the product, we want to follow up with you and have a conversation, we want to offer you more great products. Right. That extended the lifetime value, it extended the relationship, and instead of you just buying $20 worth of stuff from me, now you're going to buy $500 worth oh. of stuff from me. Oh. And, and I mean, it's just... There's almost nothing that you can do in business that can increase the size of your business, the profit, the scalability, more than really building your list and building a relationship with your customers. Now, when you say that, that to have it be a real list, I mean, there's the list and there's the list of buyers. Yeah, right. Sure. You know, and so the difference uh, it really comes down to having that level of relationship, and not just relationship, you can be a relationship, but where that they're really a raving fan, where that perceived value explodes. Is that fair to say? Sure. So, so tell me, how do you go about doing that if you're brand new yep. versus what do you do if you got a list and you need to, you got a business, but man, the world's changing, you need to expand that thing. Let's hit both of those if we could. Absolutely. So one mindset, just quickly, kind of a little bit of an inner game thing. When people think list, they actually think, I'm going to build a list. And on the list are going to be a bunch of names, and then I'm going to like throw information at that list of names, and then money is going to come back. Right. Now, to some extent, that's true. But what I recommend is you switch from groupthink to individual think, yeah. and realize that that's not a list of names. Those are individual, real human beings. Right. Each one of them at home, sitting at their computer, or on their phone, or walking into your store. They're individual people that have all their own desires and fears and you know aspirations in life and their frustrations and whatever. And if they're treated like a group, if you talk at them, they're not going to resonate with you. Right. Whereas if you treat them as an individual and you figure out how to really build that relationship with the customer as an individual, yeah. and then you replicate that individual think, that's when you can really get like resonation, that's where right. you can really get right. the long-term profit. So, right. so let's say that you're, you're new and you're starting out, how do I build a list? Script out how your conversation would go with one customer. Not mm. with a million of them, but with one. I've got a whole process that I've designed that I call the customer avatar system where you, you, know, you make an image of your customer and you, you know, do all this stuff. And Other people have things like this that they teach right. in marketing. This isn't sure. you know, a super original idea or anything. Sure. You create a customer avatar, you project out what all your customers have in common that make them unique and that, that are the needs that basically match your business. Right? I'm trying right. to simplify it a little bit here. Right. And then you say, okay, that avatar, that individual customer that represents all of them, how would I script out a relationship with them? What would I say in the first meeting? What would I say in the second meeting? If they buy something, what would I say to them? And then you actually use technology to facilitate that whole conversation. Right. The greatest tool that's been, I think, ever been developed in modern marketing is what's called the email autoresponder. Okay? Right. An email autoresponder is a system that you can get from a company like uh, getresponse.com, aweber.com, icontact.com. You can sign up for 10 or 20 bucks a month for a system. And these things are miraculous, Tony. You put a sign-in form on your website, let's just say, and it says enter your name and email. Someone enters their name and email. Behind the scenes, you program the system to follow up with them and send them emails. And right. you can say send an email every day, you can send every two days, you can program send on day one, on day seven, on day 15, and you can pre-write all of them. Right. You can have a sequence of 100 different communications that lasts you know, 100 days. And then if somebody signs up today, they get number one, and tomorrow they get number two, and the next day wow. they get number three. And this thing can manage a million of those wow. all at once. And a lot of these systems, I mean, for 20 bucks a month, you can get 50 or 100,000 people on there, and it can run this whole thing, something that was never possible before. Unbelievable. And it can just manage that relationship. So script out the relationship that you would have. Send out an email to this new person that signs up for your list and say, 
Hey, Tony, it's Evan. Thank you very much for coming to my website. I really appreciate it. I just want to let you know that I'm going to be following up with you, and every day I'm going to send you a really valuable tip on whatever. If right. it's golf, I'm going to send you a tip on how to play better golf, or I'm going to send you, you know, a great website that I found that has great golf tips or specials on golf. Right. If it's weight loss, I'm going to send you a great weight loss tip. If it's cars, I'm going to send you a cool car tip. Like, whatever it is, yeah. I'm going to send you some valuable information. Keep your eye on it. Oh, and by the way, um, I put another great free report up for you. You can go download it over here. Um, tell me what you think. You know, I'm, I'm also curious, what are your needs? Send me an email and let me know what uh, your biggest frustration is right now with your golf game. Right. You can do all this, and it automatically sends it out. Amazing. And then, you know, for the 3% or 5% of people that respond and send you a personal email and say, well, you know, thanks for asking. The thing that I'm, you know, is really screwed up in my golf game is my short game or whatever. Right. And those are the best prospects in the world because they came to your website, hand. they signed in, now they're wanting to reach out and communicate with you. They're both pain and urgent, and they're voting right now, they're looking, both simultaneously, right? And technology did it all. Wow. Technology did it all. In the past, you'd have to go through so many gyrations to get a person qualified sure. to that level. Sure. So get yourself an email autoresponder system and set up the conversation so that That's it great. just follows up and has a friendly conversation. And if you don't know what the conversation looks like, and you were you could do trial and error with some real customers, you know, just starting the process out, and you begin to find out what you want from there. Okay, please continue. Yeah, exactly. And the, the great thing about this, too, is that the, the system builds the list for you and it self-manages. So every time that it sends out an email to one of the customers, at the bottom it has a little link and it, they, the customer can click on it and remove themselves if they right. want and sure. it just kind of manages itself. Right. So that's, that's the best way to start building a list right now. I mean, I think kind of bar none, right. it's probably the greatest list building mechanism you know, for the cost that the human species has ever created. Everyone should have right. an email list. And you, but you've already said before, the inner game of, of the marketing side, besides your, your own psychological shift to adding value, then when I'm going and I'm looking at my market and I'm looking at who is that person, it's creating that avatar, as you described, of who is the ideal customer and where do I really want to take them? What's, what do they aspire to? What do they need? What do they want? If the, life, if the pain was eliminated, if the urgency was met, what does that look like? And I'm migrating this process all with this technology, basically. Yep. Got it. And there are other places you can build lists right now, too. So you can get on a social networking website, like a Facebook. Right. And you can build a huge list there by making friends with people, reaching out to them, and then you can message all of those people as well. Um, Twitter is another one that's kind of a more modern one, which they call microblogging. You can get people to follow you there. I just had a great experience that, you know, just shows all this stuff. Um, I was sitting with uh, my friend Tony Shea, who's the CEO of Zappos.com, yes. very successful business. We were yes. up in San Francisco a couple of days ago. And we were talking about their brand and their image and you know so forth. And I love to meddle in everybody's stuff. You know what I mean? And I'm like, <laughs> I got some ideas. You know, let's ask some customers what they think. And you know, I'm telling, you know, spewing out all my theories about branding, whatever. And I said, you know, the customers will tell you what it is that they want. And I said it would be really interesting to ask some people what they think of when you say your company's name. What image comes to their mind without yeah. putting anything in it? And I said right. we should just start asking people because people know Zappos. And uh, he goes, why don't we Twitter? And I said, duh. So right. I jumped on my, I mean, I was, had my laptop, opened it up. Uh, and I, these days you can do it right on your phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had it on my phone, right? Yeah. But I Twittered out right then. I sent out a tweet that said, when, you know, you think of Zappos, like, what do you think of? And, right. you know, we just got all this. It was just, we were just having fun, like just doing right. research, right? And bam, dozens of comments come back from, this is my list. Right. Okay. Right. Many of them are saying, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. I've never heard of that before. You right. know, I think of a lighter, like whatever. But a bunch of people started giving all of their thoughts, mm. and it sparked this whole conversation that yeah. we were starting to have about what real people think. And I asked them what words come to mind and what images come to mind. Mm -hmm. And we had some great, really neat insights. because we just asked, what, what came out, just out of curiosity? Oh, people said things like um, speed. You know, mm -hmm. um, people said things like uh, um, sparks, and even though they knew that it was like shoes, it's like wow. it just sounds like zap. The thing shows up. Wow. Um, um, we made a whole list of things. I don't remember what all of them were right, right. now, and like oh, different images and things. It right. was just you know, right. I, we got right into the mind of the customer. But you got it immediately is the point as well. Exactly, it was yeah. right now. So you can build a list using any of these tools, and it's the more you engage with them the more they'll engage with you. Right. I mean, I've started my blog. I've got regular readers of my blog, even though I've been doing it for a couple of months. Right. And I send you know, out on my Twitter and other places, and I send people to my blog. I mean, I write about random stuff, things that I'm interested in. Right. I, I have a little you know, series where I write about nanotechnology and robotics and artificial intelligence, and I call it the Skynet series. So I'm building a list of 
obviously very weird people that would read this stuff on my <laughs> blog, but that's another way of like building a list yes. of followers. Yes. And you you know you can build influence. And then once someone buys, I mean you you said it. There's a difference between a buyer and a prospect. Right. You know, once someone buys from you, you have to realize that they have raised their hand and they have said, I am very special. Right. I am worth probably ten times as much as or a hundred times or a thousand times as much as people that are just nibbling. Right. Treat me special. Right. What most companies do is they spend they spend their marketing dollars treating everyone the same. Right. As soon as someone raises their hand and buys, you want to put a lot of time and attention and treat that person. Put a lot more energy and give them free sure. stuff. Like, tell them you're special to me. What can I do to help you? Begin a dialogue with them to the best of your ability. Right. Um, and I think that's really the way to build the list in the, you know, in the the most valuable, right? You know, sense. Sense. In other words, the back end is what I I'm understand. saying is where the valuable list is, I'll not just it. building a list of people. I understand. Um, I, there's obviously parallels to it. Anything, if somebody already has a list about how to activate that list more, sure. uh, as well as if they got an ongoing business, I mean, they can do all the things you just said. Yep. And they can apply it to a particular niche product or service. But is there anything else you might give uh, an ongoing concern and say, okay, they've got a good sized list, but their list is not being as responsive. What do they do to activate it? You know, How do they add the value that brings that to a new level of life? Mm -hmm. What's amazing is hu people are people are people in a way okay so we're all different but we're all much more the same than we are different and humans respond very well when you reach out to them right you know walk up to a person anywhere anytime and say hey I need some help and watch what happens you know most of the right. time if you're humble most of the time the person just says what can I do to help right. they want to connect they want to have a relationship with you right. most of us in business are in like the relationship prevention business like we're <laughs> literally figuring out creative ways to prevent the customer from talking to us because we think they're going to complain or whatever but when you open up and you say you know what tell me what's on your mind you know right. I, and I, I'll give you an example of this um, uh, about how we use kind of the Frank Kern Jeff Walker product launch model to right. do this and it's it's been a huge like epiphany for me of interacting with customers but all you got to do is go to your customers send them a letter do a voice broadcast where you do a broadcast voicemail where you can just yep. search for voice broadcast and do it send them an email and all it has to say is hey Tony it's Eben you know, I feel bad. I realized that you bought my product a year ago, and I never did anything to follow up with you. I'm a bad friend. That's you know, great. like, I'm a bad friend. There it is. But I also realized that you're the most valuable person that there is to me. You bought my product. You're probably getting great, you know, value from it. And I'm out here running ads and spending money to find new people, and you're already here. So I realized that I should do something nice for you. If you've got a brick and mortar business, say, I'm having a party on Friday night. I'd really love to have you come. We're going to have some right. music or we're going to have some more. Right. Come back down to the store, hang out with me, hang out with some other customers. It's going to be a great time. Right. If it's an online business, send them a gift and say, you know what? I made this video for you. Normally I'd sell this for a hundred bucks. I just made it for you. Go watch it. I, right. I just want you to have this thing. Right. Or you can say, I've got these two new products that I've uh, been selling here. And since you're already a customer, I'm going to give you a discount one time because I just want to get the relationship going again. Right. Let's wrap up. This has been spectacular. I mean, you're, you're you. like taking a drink out of a fire hose. It's so beautiful. And it, and it all is from the heart. It's all based on added value. It's all around the values that, you know, I think anybody who's intelligent is yeah. aligned with. Uh, we've covered many of the pieces, but I know you and I both are very passionate about helping people in business. It's where 80% plus of our economy is really driven in terms of employment. Yeah. It's a place that's not getting the bailouts, you know, yeah. from the government. So uh, if there's a place I want to see a difference made, it's there. And I know that's an area that you focused on as well. When you look at a business, I know you look at it and I look at it in a very similar way in terms of chunking, but I think you've chunked it into like five areas that yep. if you're going to go from startup to at least 10 million, which you know most businesses never make it even close to that, yep. uh, these are the areas you've got to constantly focus on all five or you're not going to make progress. Right. We've covered some of them here, but we've not been explicit. Can you chunk out the five and let's, sure. let's talk about the ones we haven't touched on briefly to, to wrap this interview up and, and put people out there to go to work so they can use some of this stuff because this has been truly, truly spectacular. Thank you. So uh, I teach this in a, a program that I call Altitude. And I call it altitude because I think altitude is the most important aspect of business success. What is altitude? It's perspective. Sure. Multiple perspectives, right? right? Our mutual friend Wyatt says, wisdom comes from multiple perspectives. That's right. And so the more perspectives you can get, and the more you can get out of, I'm going to figure it out, I know best, the more right. perspectives you get, the faster you move. Right. So altitude is about zooming out, getting more perspectives, so that you can then go back and work more efficiently, more yeah, effectively. It's also a, a metaphor of working on the business versus in the business. Exactly. You know, so you really have a complete different perspective of that alone. So I break it out into five areas, which okay. are you, your market, your marketing, your people, and your systems. Perfect. So you, 
you need to develop yourself into the person that can lead and run a business, right? right. And that's, you know, there's a whole, a whole set of things you need to do there. Your market, we talked about, which is your products and services and the people that buy them, and we talked about choosing a niche. Your marketing, which is doing advertising and marketing and attracting customers and sales and things. And we touched on some of that with Move the Free Line and right. some of these ideas about the hooks and what have you. That's correct. The, the fourth area is your people, okay? Right. So if you're going to accomplish anything big in life, you wake up to the reality that it's all going to be done with and through other people. It's, right. That's what happens. And knowing how to relate to those people, organize them and so forth. And select them. And so like, it's selecting the right people crucial. may be the most important aspect of any business that's going to go beyond yourself, that's for sure. Or life. Yeah, or life. I, yeah, right? I always tell people the most important decision in life is who you're going to spend your life with. I don't think anything determines the quality of your happiness or your life more than that, for sure. Exactly. And then the last one is systems. Systemizing your business and building systems that automate the busy work and so forth so that you're freed up to do higher and higher level stuff. Okay. Right. So I'll, I'll just give you a little tip on Great. kind of each of a couple of these, right? So you. How does you affect the business? Well, the reality is that your image of yourself and of the business is going to control the success of the business. Right. Right? So you actually have to do all of this inner work and you have to figure out how to get yourself to become the kind of person that other people will respect, that can create products, that can juggle all of these different things, that can see the vision and so forth. So we don't have time to get into leadership and what right. that is and creating visions and you know executing them and getting other people enrolled in them and so forth. But I'll give you one tip that I've learned that's critically important, especially in this day and age. Al Reese and Jack Trout, we mentioned in positioning, they start the book out by saying we're the world's first over-communicated society. Right. There's too much information coming in. We have to filter it all out or we're going to go insane. Now, they said that like 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay? I know. So, mind-boggling. I think that we're just hitting the geometric, the, yeah, yeah, the, we're the, the base curve. of the curve. Yeah, no, I agree. It's not even, yeah. we, we've, we've seen nothing yet. Yeah. And unfortunately, what's happening is people are getting sucked into the distraction. Right. Multitasking, parallel processing is rampant, okay, and it's yeah. getting worse. And, and it's addictive for people because it exactly. gives them a sense of false completion. It's activity versus something that's meaningful, activity versus exactly. achievement. So, so uh, you, know, uh, you know Tim Ferriss, author yes. of 4 Hour Work Week, right. Right? very, very smart guy. Yeah. Um, on his blog, he wrote a great post that said that basically that multitasking and using your BlackBerry all day lowers your IQ more than smoking marijuana. Yeah. Right, and he cited that article about it. It was really, you yeah, know, it was kind yeah. of funny. But the bottom line is, multitasking and parallel processing and juggling lots of things at once really does dramatically reduce your productivity. Right. But people don't know this. No one realizes this yet. Peter Drucker said back in the Effective Executive, whatever, 40 years ago or something, he said, focus your time in uninterrupted blocks of right. hours. Concentration is power. It's a laser. It's anything else you want to break through, you've got to put all the focus into it. Tony Schwartz, Powerful Engagement, says something very important, which is not only are we multitasking, not only are we not focusing, but by doing it, like you said, it becomes addictive, we're losing the ability yeah. to focus. Yeah. So you wake up and you sit down and you want to focus on something, you can't do it anymore. Well, you actually you train your brain to function in a way that's most ineffective. It might might be fulfilling on the surface level, but it's not fulfilling on the deep level. Exactly. So uh, best thing I can recommend that you do is create what I call a personal success ritual. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, Tony Schwartz, very, very, very influenced by him. Powerful engagement, world class, I mean like probably top 10 book of all time kind of right. thing. And uh, focus all of your willpower in the morning when you first wake up on you. Make yourself strong. First thing that I do when I wake up in the morning is drink a half liter of fresh, clean water. Right. And I immediately go and brush and floss my teeth. Right. Then I immediately go and do some exercise. Right. Get 20 or 30 minutes of getting your heart rate up yeah. first thing. If you really want to take it to the next level, do five, just five minutes of meditation. Yeah. Right? Just calm the mind. Totally just get into your own thing. But you got to do it consistently. It's the ritual. We call it the hour of power, or 30 minutes to thrive, or 15 minutes to fulfillment. Exactly. Some segment that is absolutely consistent so you get a new layer of conditioning yourself and a lasting result. Because we're, we are the result of our rituals, whatever they are. And everybody's got them, whether they know it or not. That was, it was such a game changer for me. Um, figuring out this mindset of doing that first thing so that I have time to reflect. Right. You know, um, I, uh, I've been changing up my, uh, my workout uh, lately, but I live in a 17-story in a tower on the 17th floor, so I run all the way to the bottom of the stairs, right. and then I go all the way back up to the top, and I do right. it multiple times kind right. of thing. And what I figured out, Tony, is that my best ideas are in that staircase. That's great. That's cool. Right? So some of my best ideas come when I'm 
exercising and yep. taking care of my body and respecting yep. myself first. Yep. And there's also... And you're in a peak state. I mean, you're physiologically in a peak state. Exactly. So the mind operates that way. And when you take care of your... When you make yourself strong first, it unconsciously reprogram... It reprioritizes your whole life. Yep. And then you're stronger to help other people. Absolutely so true. you... That's just my best tip is to right. take care of yourself first. I mean, you know, you have some philosophies around this as well. We talked about your market, your marketing, your people. Okay, so Confucius said, and I'm going to paraphrase, never make friends with a man that's not greater than yourself. Mm, what a great, I've not heard that one before. That's fantastic. Okay, right? The, the actual quote, well, you know, of course it was translated. It was like, never contract a friendship with a man that's not greater than thyself. Wow. Right? And, uh, you know, they mean man in terms of the yes. species, yes. right? So man or woman in this case. Yes, she won't be shot after this video, don't worry. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Politically correct. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> These, these days, you know, but and, and you know what, I actually mean it because I try to consciously, you know, address everyone, yeah, I understand. you know, in some way. But uh, in this case, if you, so you, so you know, if you want to know how much you weigh, ask your five closest friends how much they weigh, and that's an average it, and that's how much you weigh. Yeah. If you want to know how much money you make a year, ask your five closest friends how much they. And they well, and you spend time with us, who you become. That's exactly it. And I've been thinking about this a lot in the last few years, Tony, and I'm getting really spooked out by it. <laughs> Who okay. your friends are? <laughs> yes, yes. I know all your friends are becoming my friends. This is beginning to worry me. <laughs> You've hung out with some of them. Yes. No, but I've been getting spooked out by just how much... How true it is, how accurate it is. I am, in the most, you know, almost real sense, little pieces of all of the people that I've hung out with well, in I saw my it life. Tonight. I was watching you tonight talking to Frank, and I'm watching how your humor and Frank's humor linked up in those moments. It's fascinating. Exactly, right? And it's in every great thing that I can do or that I've accomplished, if I can do any great things or have accomplished any great things, I can trace it back to, I learned that from that person, right. and I do it like them. Right. And it's spooky, right? Because I want to think I figured it all out. Right. I made all this stuff up. Not so. Right. Um, in fact, uh, you know, th there's nothing I think at this point that you can do in your life that can affect you more than just finding someone who is who you want to become and getting them in your life. And your game changes too. I mean, you, if you play a sport against somebody who is the same level you are or lower. You might have a good game, but your game's not going to get better, no matter who exactly. you are. You play against somebody you can barely stay on the court with, and I don't give a damn who you are. If you're going to stay on that court, you're going to get better. You're going to get stronger. So it's, it has a pull effect as opposed to a push effect. And there's another little inversion that we have to do here. There's another inner game thing. Uh, I think it was in uh, uh, Schwartz's book, Paradox of Choice, where he talked about, uh, they asked attorneys, they said, would you rather make $100,000 a year and be the top attorney in your firm, right. or would you ma rather make two hundred thousand dollars a year and be in a firm where you're in the middle of the pack? And the attorney said, "You're getting back to that selfish gene, or, or would you call it the justice? What the justice mechanism. Justice mechanism for you, yes. Right. Status plays into everything. I've done a lot of work on status in the attraction world and also in business. So status and kind of politics, we're always sorting at an unconscious level. Where do we fit in? Right. See, so we we need to let go of where do I, you know, what's my status, or how do I fit into the pack, and all that kind of thing, and just get into how do I add massive value, and how do I really, you know, let me say that again." We have to get out of the status game. We have to get out of the game of, you know, where do I fit into the pack and so forth, and just say, what do I want to become, and then find a human being, a real live one who Roll represents model. that, and then be around them. Yes. It's very difficult on most people's ego to be in a room full of people who are all beyond them. Yes. There's nothing that pulls you up faster. We all, I mean, you notice, I mean, when you hang out with people, most people will listen to someone tell a story, and then they go, well, you think that's good? I got an even better yeah, one. Yeah. Well, yeah, you think you were poor? I had right. to, you know, walk right. a hill both ways in the right. snow, and that whole thing. I, I suffer from, you know, like we all, we all do it's this kind of thing. Condition. Exactly. But what I found is I am continually upgrading my reference group. That's awesome. Right? I learned this from Napoleon Hill and Brian Tracy. Right. Napoleon Hill calls it the mastermind. Brian Tracy talks about the reference group. You become who you surround yourself with, right. and one of the the magical things of being human that other species don't get is we can choose the people that we surround ourselves with so and true. therefore we can choose what we become. So we true. mostly can't do it with our will and we can't do it by thinking about it and hoping right. that we're going to do it. Surround yourself with who you want to become. So that's the people. But can we cover one more piece on people which is selection? How do you know, yeah. how do you find, and how do you know you got the right people? Okay. Right people in the right seats, but let's at least go for the right people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you want to really screw your business up, hire people that, number one, you like, 
And number two, they're like you. That's true. That's it. That's right? Hire true. people that you really, really like and hire people that are really, really like you, and they're usually the same person. Yeah. What you're usually doing is you're projecting yourself out there, and you're going, wow, that's a younger version of me. Right. And, of course, what they do, Michael Gerber likes to say this one, is they come in, they work for you for a year, and then they steal your idea, and they go right. start another business because they're right. you, and that's, that's what right. you did. Right. right. Or, you know, whatever, yeah. right? And like, What you got to do is find compliments. Right? Right. Find people that aren't like you, that can do all the things that you're not good at. Number one, you got to learn to recognize those people, and you got to learn to say, "Oh, okay, it is. You are different, and we don't agree in certain ways, but you do a great job over here, and I do a great job over here." And uh, number two, hire superstars only. Right. That's it. Right. Don't settle for average. Brad Smart, who wrote the book Top Grading, right. probably the best book. He's probably the top guy that I know of in the world on hiring and recruiting and whatever and interviewing. Right. And he says uh, he did a study. Um, the cost of a mishire. Okay, so number one. 75% of all people that are hired are mishires. Three out of four. Meaning you eventually realize they're not the right person. For the not job. the right person, they get fired, they don't work out, whatever. So 75% wrong. The average cost of a mishire is, he did a, a, a you know, kind of an exhaustive set of research, right. 23 times their average salary. Their annual How is that salary. Possible? It doesn't even make sense, does it? Well, we so that means that if somebody makes fifty thousand dollars a year, that the total nut that it's going to cost you is over a million dollars. What we don't realize is you didn't have the right person doing the right thing, growing the business. Right. Okay. You were paying this person. They were sucking up your time, other people's time to get trained. The wrong people, low, you know, C players. They're the ones that sue you, Without and do, doubt. you know, they weave, they build what I call black boxes inside your business, things that only they know how to operate. So, you know, so C they're players supposedly invaluable, but they're really destroying the businesses because there's no system anymore. C players usually have one talent, and that is establishing job security. Mm. That's what they're really good at. Okay? What's a B player good at? Well, B players, I don't know, because okay. I just kind of try you to think of C and A, right? Okay. You right. know, a good, solid B player that can do something really, really well for you, sometimes you, you know, it's worth keeping around, but A players. And the best, you know, predictor of their future performance is their past performance, actually, in work situations. And Brad Smart recommends a serial uh, interview where you go through a whole process and you actually interview the person and you say, okay, why'd you get that job and what were your expectations and what, you know, what were your strengths? What were your weaknesses? What'd you succeed at? What'd you fail at? Why'd you leave? And then, what would your boss say if right. I talked to them? Yeah. What your strengths and weaknesses? And then you look for patterns, right. and you look for people that are performers. Right. And when you hire them, you really watch very hard to make sure that they're superstars because everyone comes in with their, you know, their game face on, and they walk into the interview after reading a book on how to do interviews, and they're yeah. better at it than you because they've been doing fifty of them, and you're right. just hiring your first person or the first person like that. Right. So you have to. You know, and another thing, I'll just give you a, a, a quick little insight I've, I've learned. Beware of smooth talkers. Mm. Any human being that is a smooth, polished talker sends up a giant red flag for me immediately. Mm. Right. If they're too smooth, to me, that usually means that they're, there's something that they can't perform in the real world. Right. I like to say smooth talkers usually aren't smooth doers. Mm. And what you'll find is in the first 30, 60, 90 days, that super smooth talker that talked like you left and you went, I have finally found the person that's going right. to solve all my problems. They know everything. It's 30, 60, 90 days into it, they just, things aren't kind of getting it done. It isn't just that presentation is smooth. What you're saying is they're making everything feel like it can be solved so easily. They don't acknowledge any exactly. limitations on, si on their side, et cetera. Exactly. Right. And when your gut tells you something's wrong, right. it is. Right. Trust your gut and get rid of them early. Right. Fire them after 30 days, 60 days. Don't wait for a year or two while you're trying to rehabilitate them and go, but wait, you know, I could see that you saw the vision and you knew how to do it. How do I get this out of you? You know, we've all gotten ourselves into all right. kinds of trouble. In well, that often they say, we've said it's not the person you hire, it's the person you don't fire that destroys the business so often, right? Exactly, right? Hire slowly, right. fire quickly. Now, you, I know, had kind of like a test that when somebody has just joined you, if I remember correctly. Yep. Can you tell me what that test is? Sure. So let's get into systems. I'm okay. going to give you one quick system. You got and it. This is a system that involves people. Great. Uh, one of the most valuable things that I've ever done just used it recently with with great success really really helped me out I call it the daily update right. you hire a new person you sit them down on day one and you say Tony we're gonna be working together really excited about working with you I'd like you to do one thing for me at the end of every workday I'd like you to send me a daily update send it to be my email it should take you five minutes to do ten minutes max if it takes you more than five to ten minutes you're doing something wrong right. in the daily update I want you to tell me three things number one what I did today, results I got. Right. Number two, problems or challenges that you know came up. Right. Number three, 
questions that I have for you. Right. Okay, so what I did today, results I got, problems and challenges, questions. Right. If you will watch someone's daily updates every day for 30 days, you will learn so much about them that people have known them for years, don't even realize, because you will see the pattern. Right. Are they results driven? Are they activity driven? Do they even you know notice the difference in their life? Noticing whether or not they're really even asking any new questions, whether they're getting curious about things in any new way, shape, or form. What is perceived by them to be a problem versus exactly? You know, Will they it? ask you if they have a problem? Yeah. You know yeah. what's what's going on? Um, mm -hmm. it's and really great. Even even more importantly, do they send it to you every day? <laughs> Okay. The most basic right. test of no, all. Really? <laughs> That's true. Okay. Because You're absolutely right. When you get to the end of the first thirty days, <laughs> and you got twelve of them, or six, or exactly. none. Exactly. <laughs> there, there are a couple of scenarios. One is they sent it every day, but it's bad news. Yeah. One is they sent it every day, and it's good news. Yeah. Another is they sent, didn't send it every day, and it's bad news. Another is they, you know, didn't good yeah. news, whatever. So there are kind of these options. If you've got someone that's performing, they're just kicking ass. It actually doesn't matter whether they sent them every day or not Absolutely because they're right. a they're a performer. Yeah. If they're a superstar and they didn't send the daily update every day, you can say we're going to get you an assistant that's going to send your updates every right. day. Okay. Right. Right. Fine. Just tell and, them. And maybe you can coach <laughs> them or whatever. Right. But if they're not performing and they're not sending daily updates or they're not performing and sending daily, you'll see it. And I mean, in my experience, the underperformance they usually don't send the update every day. Right. And then when you sit down with them at the end of thirty days, you can just say, look. I asked you to do one thing consistently for this 30 That's days. Great. That's really great. Right? I asked you to do one thing, and which just send me a little daily update. And they'll have excuses or whatever will come up. And you say, I just don't feel like this is going to be a good fit because we need results and accountability and communication, and it's just not your style to do that. Right. You know, you're not, then it then it kind of works out for everybody. You know, it's right. in everybody's right. best interest. Right. So the daily update has been tremendously valuable. How long have you been doing this? Since I started. Oh wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. So I have a whole set of qualities that I teach to look for when you're hiring a person. Right. Right? There are five key qualities. The one single most important quality is what I call a driver. Mm. And the driver personality can be any personality type, but drivers are those people that show up and they say, I'd like more responsibility, I'd like something to do. They take it, they own it, they take it all the way to results. Okay? So a driver is someone who is proactive. That's right. Okay, so they're not reactive. Right. Most people that most people in the business world, if uh, you know, let's say they're working on a project and they send you over an email and they say, "Hey, Tony, I'm working on this thing. I need to ask you a question. What's this?" and you don't respond to them, most people just kind of like go, "Yeah, okay." Right. Um, and then a month they later, they don't get the outcome. A month later, they'll tell you why they didn't get it. Or, well, a month yeah. later, you show up and you say, "Hey, where's that project at?" And they say, "Well, I emailed you and oh, I never heard back." Right? Drives me crazy. And you want to shoot yourself immediately, yeah. right? Yeah, and, yeah, and like, well, you like postal. Too. Yeah, right. Then, then yourself <laughs> and you have all these fantasies, right? Well. The, the driver, they email you, they don't hear back. The next day, they email you again, they don't hear back. Then they call you, right. and then they show up. Hey, Tony. Right. And there's nothing weird. Okay, right. They're not upset. They're not emotional. They're saying, you know what, Tony? I need to get this from you because I've got to push this thing forward. We, you know, This is in our, both of our best interest. And they, right. gr they you know, turn your head to look right. at their thing, and then they right. get the thing done. Right. So they're proactive. They're not reactive. Got it. Huge, right? Another thing is they have a sense of result orientation. Right. Right? So instead of work, they're focused on results. Most people can't conceive of a result. Right. Most people will work on something for 40 hours, and then you, like a new opportunity will come up to just end run the whole thing, buy a piece of software that just solves it, and they'll be like, but I got 40 hours in this, and I got to see it through to completion, even though it's going to cost the company an extra $4 million. Right. I'm invested in this thing, right? right? So sense of result. Another thing is a sense of personal responsibility. Right. Most people don't want to take personal responsibility in business settings. They want to distribute it among everyone else so that if something goes good, they can take the credit. But if something goes wrong, they can say, that yeah, was all their faults. Right. So right. personal responsibility, the right. person will show up and say, this thing went wrong, I take responsibility. This thing went right, it was the team that did it. Right. So when you put all these qualities together, you get someone who's proactive, result-oriented, has a sense of ownership. There's a lot more to it. But this is the person that shows up, says, I want more. They take it. And then they say, I will deliver the result. Right. And th those are the most magical type of people, as you know, in business. Well, you may have just answered my, my uh, the question I wanted to ask you, which is, how do you manage your business where all your employees are virtual? My guess is one way is you select the right people that yes. meet the criteria you're just describing. Is that true? Hire drivers. Hire drivers. And what else do you do to be able to manage that effectively, if I may ask? 
Well, we're kind of weird because, I mean, I don't know any businesses that have 80 people virtually. I've heard of a few others yeah. now, but it just grew organically. I didn't right. have some master plan. I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to be the most innovative business person in the world, right. whatever. It just happened. I liked working from home. I had a high value of freedom. I like to be able to being able to go out in the middle of the day and go get something to eat or yep. do whatever I want. I thought I'll bet other people would like that too, and it turns out they do. Right. They love it, and they love when you say, "Here's what we're trying to do. Go make it happen." You know, a little bit of structure to make it happen. Right. Hire great drivers. Um, it's taken me a long time to figure this out because I'm not naturally a good leader and manager personally. Um, right. In fact, I have to work hard to do it. I'm more of a starter of things than a manager and a right. finisher of things. Right. Um, but I'll tell you some of the things we've learned over the last few years have been very, very valuable for us. Okay, um, One of them is work in 90-day chunks of time seem to be kind of the sweet spot. Hmm. So get together with your team every 90 days and say, what are we going to do in the next 90 days? Right. Corporate America runs on quarters, 90-day cycles. Right. It's a period of time that anyone can conceptualize in. If it takes longer than that, business is changing too fast right now. You can't right. think longer than that. Right. There's 90 days and then there's forever. <laughs> okay, like those are the time frames in yeah, business yeah. and today, like what yeah, are we going right. to do today? Yeah. Another thing that's very valuable as well that uh, we started right from the beginning and uh, we're starting to kind of circle back to right now is daily huddles. Right. Every team get together in the morning and today and do a quick little huddle and say, all right, what's everybody doing today? Right. right? And then look at results. In uh, the virtual environment, we've got teams and team leaders and you know right. kind of strata and so forth, even though we have kind of one of these non-hierarchical businesses. Yeah. Everyone organizes into groups and self-organizes and so forth. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that drivers, performers, superstars, I, I got to ask Eric Schmidt, who's the CEO of Google. I yes. went to a conference and went up to the mic and asked him. I said, you guys have hired all these great people. You've hired some of the top talent in the world. What have you learned? And he said, superstars, they work for impact, mm. not for money. Mm. So true. They want to see the world change because of what they do. That's right? so, so true. Get them into contact with making the world change. Wow, that's fantastic. Show them the project that's going to change the world, and you know it'll help it'll help that's make true. that happen. Um, I also uh, another another little selection tip that I got from uh, Steve Ballmer. I met him at a conference, and I asked him the same well, not the same thing, but a similar thing. I said, you know, what, what have you learned about selecting people, hiring people, whatever? And he said, um, look for passion and a successful track record driving projects to completion. Mm. Yeah, you're right. And I said, well, that's, Comes back to your criteria. There's a guy who's hired a lot of successful people, yeah. right? So, you know, look for superstars. Very cool. So I just want uh, to say, what words of wisdom do you have about having a meaningful and fulfilling life? Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, when it's all said and done, it doesn't matter what you achieve, what you accomplish, you know, what, what is it that lights people up? I think you have a good sense of what that is in you, and I think that's guiding mm -hmm. you really well. What would you say to somebody else out there when it's all said and done and, and you know achieved all the dreams and goals and so forth? Yeah. What is it that you believe that makes life really truly worthwhile? What would be, you know, the way that you'd look at whatever you call that meaningfulness, success, uh, mm. a life well lived? What is that for you? Well, you know, I'll kind of tack into this uh, answer with I, I wrote a, a blog post on my new blog recently yes. that uh, was, was basically about the new wealth. Yes. Because I think that. The, the meaning is changing right now, the external meaning of right. it, right, and the internal meaning of it. Whereas in the past, it was about accumulating and getting money and right. extracting and so forth. Wealth now is literally transforming to a higher order. Right. And wealth now is about creating more relationship, creating right. more education, creating right. more collaboration, creating more abundance on, in these social and human realms and life realms. Right. And the, the fascinating thing about what I think of as the new wealth is it's all the candle lighting another candle phenomenon where when you give it away you still have it right and in fact it's like love it's brighter it's stronger when you give it away you get more right and so so because most of us have this justice mechanism and we're not willing to give unless we get something back too many of us are thinking small if I come to you and I teach you something I learn in the process right so not only do you get something, I still know the thing that I taught you, right. but I actually learn more about it, and I learn how to teach, and I learn sure. how you learn, and I get the gratification of you learning. It's additive. Right. If I love you, if I demonstrate love, not like I feel the feeling of love, but right. I, I accept you unconditionally, I go through a change myself, you get love, it, goes, you know, it just goes on. If I get five people together that don't know each other and we collaborate around a problem and we work on something and I help build these relationships, I still have all the relationships with right. people. Now we've gotten 20 new relationships that have happened right. in there. Okay? Right. So the new wealth, all of it, is it's exponential 
and it's not something when you give it away you still have it you actually have more of it right. so it's an important mindset for us to all realize wonderful. in the new reality that we're all entering right now uh, it makes it makes me think about you know the justice system is really the injustice system to yourself it you is because the more you, back. the more you're trying to not give or try to measure the more trapped you are in a world of scarcity and pain and the more you you put out the light that's already inside you so if i have to wrap it all up one of the things that i teach in business is that possibly the most valuable and profitable business skill is compassion. Hmm. What is compassion? I define it in, in kind of regular language as proactive empathy, hmm. where I don't just feel what you feel, but I actually seek to understand where you're coming from. Right. right? So I said wisdom comes from multiple perspectives, right? What right. Wyatt talks about. Stephen Covey said that if he had to wrap it all up and put it in one sentence, he said it would be seek first to understand. Right. So if there were a practice in life that could help you have more fulfillment, more joy, more happiness, it's that one thing. It's to continually, with every person that you interact with, whether they're a customer, a family member, a friend, to try to do what Keats called the negative capability, put yourself aside, right. and really try to see what it's like to be them. Ask questions, say, how do you feel? How do you see this? What's your perspective? Ne don't marginalize anyone really believe that they have the best intention and seek to understand them. Right. The more you do that, what happens is the more rapport you build, the more trust you build. The more you understand the other person so you can help meet their needs, mm. and the more you create uh, a bond of that, that transcends. And then what happens is what I think of as being the, the thing that the world really needs right now, and it's something that's been happening for me and it's been kind of blowing my mind lately. Um, I'm fascinated with people like Gandhi and Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King not because I can even imagine myself being that selfless as those people were but I'm starting to get a window into what was going on there was a point in each of their lives and if you study their lives you can see where something happened it was right. a huge shift where if you don't know how to think about it it doesn't make any sense but it, through a certain lens what you realize is they stopped identifying with just themselves right. and they started identifying and realizing oh wait if there's a center of the universe it's not here right. these are we're all alive we all have the same genes going through us we are a maximum 50th cousin right. every one of us and right. actually it's much fewer we're all cousins and brothers and sisters we all have the same you know great 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 grandparents right. and grandmothers we're all one and the more you seek to understand the more you really do that, proactively try to empathize with another person and feel compassion and see it from their perspective and say... The more you understand yourself. Well, the more you understand yourself, but the more you dissolves. Yeah, I understand. First. Right? And the more you start to realize, oh, wait a minute, there's a bigger game here. Yeah. We're all on the space terrarium right. flying around the sun at 18 miles a second and around the galaxy at, you know, what is it? 150 miles a second right. and it's this delicate little balance and we've got to wake up and we've got to help each other we've got to yeah. solve our significant problems I gotta stop worrying about how to get better clothes or a nicer car or make someone you know approve of me and I've got to start helping other people and what's miraculous is when you start understanding other people and then you start helping other people you become more fulfilled right. they become more fulfilled you start dissolving a little bit and becoming more integrated you feel more at home on your own planet right. and I think that and then you can contribute to the greater, you know, the greater cause. And I think that, that that's something that everyone can do. It's a practice of seeking first to understand, always starting every situation with, you know what, you believe you're right and you have a good intention and let me understand where you're coming from and let me not marginalize you and let me help you get what you want. That's when we can start to affect that change that these great leaders have affected in their own lives and that's when I think we can really actualize and then transcend. So if I had one piece of advice, it's to try to understand where other people are coming from develop learn about what compassion means really seek to understand it to to do it practice it with every person you meet and your life will transform mm -hmm. guaranteed it's beautiful i have loved our time together once again cannot thank you not enough for your generosity i think there are just so many gems here you've uh, definitely practiced what you preach here and adding just massive value and i can't thank you enough thanks buddy. thank you buddy god bless
So bad.